Chapter Thirty of the Prairie by James Fenimore Cooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Peck. Is this proceeding just and honorable? Shakespeare. During the occurrence of these events on the upland plain, the warriors on the bottom had not been idle. We left the adverse bands watching one another on the opposite banks of the stream, each endeavouring to excite its enemy to some act of indiscretion, by the most reproachful taunts and revilings. But the Pawnee chief was not slow to discover that his crafty antagonist had no objection to waste the time so idly, and, as they mutually proved, in expedients that were so entirely useless. He changed his plans accordingly, and withdrew from the bank, as has been already explained through the mouth of the trapper, in order to invite the more numerous host of the Sioux to cross. The challenge was not accepted, and the loops were compelled to frame some other method to attain their end. Instead of any longer throwing away the precious moments in fruitless endeavors to induce his foe to cross the stream, the young partisan of the Pawnees led his troops at a swift gallop along its margin in quest of some favorable spot where by a sudden push he might throw his own band without loss to the opposite shore. The instant his object was discovered, each mounted Teton received a footman behind him, and Matori was still enabled to concentrate his whole force against the effort. Perceiving that his design was anticipated, and unwilling to blow his horses by a race that would disqualify them for service, even after they had succeeded in outstripping the more heavily burdened cattle of the Sioux, Hardheart drew up and came to a dead halt on the very margin of the watercourse. As the country was too open for any of the usual devices of savage warfare, and time was so pressing, the chivalrous Pawnee resolved to bring on the result by one of those acts of personal daring, for which the Indian braves are so remarkable, and by which they often purchase their highest and dearest renown. The spot he had selected was favorable to such a project, the river, which throughout most of the course was deep and rapid, had expanded there to more than twice its customary width, and the rippling of its waters proved that it flowed over a shallow bottom. In the center of the current there was an extensive and naked bed of sand, but a little raised above the level of the stream, and of a color and consistency which warranted, to a practice eye, that it afforded a firm and safe foundation for the foot. To this spot the partisan now turned his wistful gaze, nor was he long in making his decision. First speaking to his warriors, and apprising them of his intentions, he dashed into the current, and partly by swimming, and more by the use of his horse's feet, he reached the island in safety. The experience of Hardheart had not deceived him. When his snorting steed issued from the water, he found himself on a tremendous but damp and compact bed of sand, that was admirably adapted to the exhibition of the finest powers of the animal. The horse seemed conscious of the advantage, and bore his warlike rider with an elasticity of step and a loftiness of air that would have done no discredit to the highest trained and most generous charger. The blood of the chief himself quickened with the excitement of his situation. He sat the beast as if conscious that the eyes of the two tribes were on his movements, and, as nothing could be more acceptable and grateful to his own band, than this display of native grace and courage, so nothing could be more taunting and humiliating to their enemies. The sudden appearance of the Pawnee on the sands was announced among the Tetons by a general yell of savage anger. A rush was made to the shore, followed by a discharge of fifty arrows and a few fusees, and, on the part of several braves, there was a plain manifestation of a desire to plunge into the water in order to punish the temerity of their insolent foe, but a call and a mandate from Matori checked the rising and nearly ungovernable temper of his band. So far from allowing a single foot to be wet, or a repetition of the fruitless efforts of his people to drive away their foe with missiles, the whole of the party was commanded to retire from the shore while he himself communicated his intentions to one or two of his most favored followers. When the Pawnees observed the rush of their enemies, twenty warriors rode into the stream, but so soon as they perceived that the Tetons had withdrawn, they fell back to a man, leaving the young chief to the support of his own often-tried skill and well-established courage. The instructions of Hardheart on quitting his band had been worthy of self-devotion and daring of his character. 
so long as single warriors came against him, he was to be left to the keeping of the Wakanda and his own arm. But should the Sioux attack him in numbers, he was to be sustained, man for man, even to the extent of his whole force. These generous orders were strictly obeyed, and though so many hearts in the troop panted to share in the glory and danger of their partisan, not a warrior was found among them all who did not know how to conceal his impatience under the usual mask of Indian self-restraint. They watched the issue with quick and jealous eyes, nor did a single exclamation of surprise escape them when they saw, as will soon be apparent, that the experiment of their chief was as likely to conduce to peace as to war. Matori was not long in communicating his plans to his confidence, whom he as quickly dismissed to join their fellows in the rear. The Teton entered a short distance into the stream and halted. Here he raised his hand several times, with the palm outwards, and made several of those other signs, which are construed into a pledge of amicable intentions among the inhabitants of those regions. Then, as if to confirm the sincerity of his faith, he cast his fusee to the shore and entered deeper into the water, where he again came to a stand, in order to see in what manner the Pawnee would receive his pledges of peace. The crafty Sioux had not made his calculations on the noble and honest nature of his more youthful rival in vain. Hardheart had continued galloping across the sands during the discharge of missiles and the appearance of a general onset, with the same proud and confident mien as that with which he had first braved the danger. When he saw the well-known person of the Teton partisan enter the river, he waved his hand in triumph, and flourishing his lance, he raised the thrilling war-cry of his people as a challenge for him to come on. But when he saw the signs of a truce, though deeply practiced in the treachery of savage combats, he disdained to show a less manly reliance on himself than that which his enemy had seen fit to exhibit. Riding to the farthest extremity of the sands, he cast his own fusee from him, and returned to the point whence he had started. The two chiefs were now armed alike. Each had his spear, his bow, his quiver, his little battle-axe, and his knife, and each had also a shield of hides which might serve as a means of defense against a surprise from any of these weapons. The Sioux no longer hesitated, but advanced deeper into the stream, and soon landed on a point of the island which his courteous adversary had left free for that purpose. Had one been there to watch the countenance of Matori as he crossed the water that separated him from the most formidable and most hated of all his rivals, he might have fancied that he could trace the gleamings of his secret joy, breaking through the cloud which deep cunning and heartless treachery had drawn before his swarthy visage and yet there would have been moments when he might have believed that the flashings of the Teton's eye and the expansion of his nostrils had their origin in a nobler sentiment and one more worthy of an Indian chief. The Pawnee awaited the time of his enemy with calmness and dignity. The Teton made a short run or two to curb the impatience of his steed, and to recover his seat after the effort of crossing, and then he rode into the centre of the place and invited the other, by a courteous gesture, to approach. Hardheart drew nigh, until he found himself at a distance equally suited to the advance or to retreat, and, in his turn, he came to a stand, keeping his glowing eye riveted on that of his enemy. A long and grave pause succeeded this movement, during which these two distinguished braves, who were now for the first time confronted with arms in their hands, sat regarding each other like warriors who knew how to value the merits of a gallant foe, however hated. But the mien of Matori was far less stern and warlike than that of the partisan of the Loops. Throwing his shield over his shoulder, as if to invite the confidence of the other, he made a gesture of salutation, and was the first to speak. "'Let the Pawnees go upon the hills,' he said, "'and look from the morning to the evening sun, from the country of snows to the land of many flowers, and they will see that the earth is very large.' Why cannot the red men find room on it for all their villages? Has the Teton ever known a warrior of the Loops come to his towns to beg a place for his lodge? Returned a young brave, with a look in which pride and contempt were not attempted to be concealed. When the Pawnees hunt, do they send runners to ask Matari if there are no Sioux on the prairies? When there is hunger in the lodge of a warrior, he looks for the buffalo, which is given him for food. 
the Teton continued, struggling to keep down the ire excited by the other's scorn. The Wakanda has made more of them than he has made Indians. He has not said, This buffalo shall be for a Pawnee, and that for a Dakota, this beaver for Kanza, and that for an Omawa. No, he said, There are enough. I love my red children, and I have given them great riches. The swiftest horse shall not go from the village of the Tetons to the village of the Loops and many sons. It is far from the towns of the Pawnees to the river of the Osages. There is room for all that I love. Why then should a red man strike his brother? Hard Heart dropped one end of his lance to the earth, and having also cast a shield across his shoulder, he sat leaning lightly on the weapon, as he answered with a smile of no doubtful expression. Are the Tetons weary of the hunts and of the warpath? Do they wish to cook the venison and not to kill it? Do they intend to let the hair cover their heads, that their enemies shall not know where to find their scalps? Go, a Pawnee warrior will never come among such Sioux squaws for a wife. A frightful gleam of ferocity broke out of the restraint of the Dakota's countenance as he listened to this biting insult but he was quick in subduing the tell-tale feeling in an expression much better suited to his present purpose. "'This is the way a young chief should talk of war,' he answered with singular composure. "'But Matori has seen the misery of more winters than his brother. When the nights have been long, and darkness has been in his lodge, while the young men slept, he has thought of the hardships of his people. He has said to himself, "'Teton, count the scalps in your smoke.' They are all red, but two. Does the wolf destroy the wolf, or the rattler strike his brother? You know they do not. Therefore, Teton, are you wrong to go on a path that leads to the village of a redskin with a tomahawk in your hand? The Sioux would rob the warrior of his fame? He would say to his young men, Go, dig roots in the prairies, and find holes to bury your tomahawks in. You are no longer braves. If the tongue of Matori ever says thus, returned the crafty chief, with an appearance of strong indignation, let this woman cut it out, and burn it with the offals of the buffalo. No, he added, advancing a few feet nigher to the immovable hardheart, as if in the sincerity of confidence. The red man can never want an enemy. They are plentier than the leaves on the trees, the birds in the heavens or the buffaloes on the prairies. Let my brother open his eyes wide. Does he nowhere see an enemy he would strike? How long is it since the Teton counted the scalps of his warriors that were drying in the smoke of a Pawnee lodge? The hand that took them is here, and ready to make eighteen, twenty. Now, let not the mind of my brother go on a crooked path. If a redskin strikes a redskin for ever, who will be masters of the prairies, when no warriors are left to say, they are mine? Hear the voices of the old men. They tell us that in their days many Indians have come out of the woods under the rising sun, and that they have filled the prairies with their complaints of the robberies of the long knives. Where a pale face comes, a red man cannot stay. The land is too small. They are always hungry. See, they are here already. As the Teton spoke, he pointed towards the tents of Ishmael, which were in plain sight, and then he paused, to await the effect of his words on the mind of his ingenious foe. Hardheart listened like one in whom a train of novel ideas had been excited by the reasoning of the other. He mused for a minute before he demanded, What do the wise chiefs of the Sioux say must be done? They think that the moccasin of every pale-face should be followed, like the track of the bear, that the long knife, who comes upon the prairie should never go back, that the path shall be open to those who come and shut to those who go. Yonder are many. They have horses and guns. They are rich, but we are poor. Will the Pawnees meet the Tetons in council? And when the sun is gone behind the rocky mountains, they will say, This is for a loop, and this is for a Sioux. Teton, no! Hard Heart has never struck the stranger. They come into his lodge and eat and they go out in safety. A mighty chief is their friend. When my people call the young men to go on the warpath, the moccasin of Hardheart is the last. 
but his village is no sooner hid by the trees than it is the first. No, Teton, his arm will never be lifted against a stranger. Fool, die with empty hands, Matori exclaimed, setting an arrow to his bow, and sending it with a sudden and deadly aim full at the naked bosom of his generous and confiding enemy. The action of the treacherous Teton was too quick and too well matured to admit of any of the ordinary means of defence on the part of the Pawnee. His shield was hanging at his shoulder, and even the arrow had been suffered to fall from its place, and lay in the hollow of the hand which grasped his bow. But the quick eye of the brave had time to see the movement, and his ready thoughts did not desert him. Pulling hard and with a jerk upon the rein, his steed reared his forward legs into the air, and, as the rider bent his body low, the horse served for a shield against the danger. So true, however, was the aim, and so powerful the force by which it was sent, that the arrow entered the neck of the animal and broke the skin on the opposite side. Quicker than thought, Hardheart sent back an answering arrow. The shield of the Teton was transfixed, but his person was untouched. For a few moments the twang of the bow and the glancing of arrows were incessant. Notwithstanding, the combatants were compelled to give so large a portion of their care to the means of defence. The quivers were soon exhausted, and though blood had been drawn, it was not in sufficient quantities to impair the energy of the combat. A series of masterly and rapid evolutions with the horses now commenced. The wheelings, the charges, the advances, and the circuitous retreats were like the fights of circling swallows. Blows were struck with the lance, the sand was scattered in the air, and the shocks often seemed to be unavoidably fatal. But still each party kept his seat, and still each rein was managed with a steady hand. At length the Teton was driven to the necessity of throwing himself from his horse to escape a thrust that would otherwise have proved fatal. The Pawnee passed his lance through the beast, uttering a shout of triumph as he galloped by. Turning in his tracks, he was about to push the advantage, when his own mettled steed staggered and fell under a burden that he could no longer sustain. Matori answered his premature cry of victory, and rushed upon the entangled youth with knife and tomahawk. The utmost agility of Hardheart had not sufficed to extricate himself in season from the fallen beast. He saw that his case was desperate. Feeling for his knife, he took the blade between a finger and thumb, and cast it with admirable coolness at his advancing foe. The keen weapon whirled a few times in the air and its point meeting the naked breast of the impetuous Sioux, the blade was buried to the buckhorn haft. Matori laid his hand on the weapon, and seemed to hesitate whether to withdraw it or not. For a moment his countenance darkened with the most inextinguishable hatred and ferocity, and then, as if inwardly admonished how little time he had to lose, he staggered to the edge of the sands, and halted with his feet in the water. The Cunning and duplicity, which had so long obscured the brighter and nobler traits of his character, were lost in the never-dying sentiment of pride which he had imbibed in youth. "'Boy of the loops,' he said, with a smile of grim satisfaction, "'the scalp of a mighty Dakota shall never dry in Pawnee smoke.' Drawing the knife from the wound, he hurled it towards the enemy in disdain. Then, shaking his arm at his successful foe, his swarthy countenance appearing to struggle with volumes of scorn and hatred, that he could not utter with the tongue, he cast himself headlong into one of the most rapid veins of the current, his hand still waving in triumph above the fluid, even after his body had sunk into the tide forever. Hardheart was by this time free. The silence, which had hitherto reigned in the bands, was suddenly broken by general and tumultuous shouts. Fifty of the adverse warriors were already in the river, hastening to destroy or to defend the conqueror, and the combat was rather on the eve of its commencement than near its termination. But to all these signs of danger and need the young victor was insensible. He sprang for the knife and bounded with the foot of an antelope along the sands, looking for the receding fluid which concealed his prize. A dark, bloody spot indicated the place, and, armed with the knife, he plunged into the stream, resolute to die in the flood, or to return with his trophy. In the meantime, the sands became a scene of bloodshed and violence. Better mounted and perhaps more ardent, the Pawnees had, however, reached the spot in their sufficient numbers to force their enemies to retire. The victors pushed their success to the opposite shore, and gained the solid ground in the melee of the fight. Here they were met by all the unmounted Tetons, 
and, in their turn, they were forced to give away. The combat now became more characteristic and circumspect, as the hot impulses which had driven both parties to mingle in so deadly a struggle began to cool, the chiefs were enabled to exercise their influence and to temper the assaults with prudence. In consequence of the admonitions of their leaders, the Sioux sought such covers as the grass afforded, or here and there some bush or slight inequality of the ground, and the charges of the Pawnee warriors necessarily became more wary and, of course, less fatal. In this manner, the contest continued with a varied success, and without much loss. The Sioux had succeeded in forcing themselves into a thick growth of rank grass, where the horses of their enemies could not enter, or where, when entered, they were worse than useless. It became necessary to dislodge the Tetons from this cover, or the object of the combat must be abandoned. Several desperate efforts had been repulsed, and the disheartened Pawnees were beginning to think of a retreat when the well-known war-cry of Hardheart was heard at hand, and at the next instant the chief appeared in their centre, flourishing the scalp of the great Sioux as a banner that would lead to victory. He was greeted by a shout of delight, and followed into the cover with an impetuosity that, for the moment, drove all before it. But the bloody trophy in the hand of the partisan served as an incentive to the attack as well as to the assailants. Matori had left many a daring brave behind him in his band and the orator, who in the debates of that day had manifested such pacific thoughts, now exhibited the most generous self-devotion in order to wrest the memorial of a man he had never loved from the hands of the avowed enemies of his people. The result was in favor of numbers. After a severe struggle, in which the finest displays of personal intrepidity were exhibited by all the chiefs, the Pawnees were compelled to retire upon the open bottom, closely pressed by the Sioux who failed not to seize each foot of ground seated by their enemies. Had the Tetons stayed their efforts on the margin of the grass, it is probable that the honor of the day would have been theirs, notwithstanding the irretrievable loss they had sustained in the death of Matari. But the more reckless braves of the band were guilty of an indiscretion that entirely changed the fortunes of the fight and suddenly stripped them of their hard-earned advantages. A Pawnee chief had sunk under the numerous wounds he had received, and he fell, a target for a dozen arrows, in the very last group of his retiring party. Regardless alike of inflicting further injury on their foes, and of the temerity of the act, the Sioux braves bounded forward with a whoop, each man burning with the wish to reap the high renown of striking the body of the dead. They were met by hard heart and a chosen knot of warriors all of whom were just as stoutly bent on saving the honor of their nation from so foul a stain. The struggle was hand to hand, and blood began to flow more freely. As the Pawnees retired with the body, the Sioux pressed upon their footsteps, and at length the whole of the latter broke out of the cover with a common yell, and threatened to bear down all opposition by sheer physical superiority. The fate of Hardheart and his companions, all of whom would have died rather than relinquish their object, would have been quickly sealed, but for a powerful and unlooked-for interposition in their favor. A shout was heard from a little break on the left, and a volley from the fatal western rifle immediately succeeded. Some five or six Sioux leaped forward in the death agony, and every arm among them was as suddenly suspended as if the lightning had flashed from the clouds to aid the cause of the loops. Then came Ishmael and his stout sons in open view, bearing down upon their late treacherous allies, with looks and voices that proclaimed the character of the succor. The shock was too much for the fortitude of the Tetons. Several of their bravest chiefs had already fallen, and those that remained were instantly abandoned by the whole of the inferior herd. A few of the most desperate braves still lingered nigh the fatal symbol of their honor, and there nobly met their deaths under the blows of the re-encouraged Pawnees. A second discharge from the rifles of the squatter and his party completed the victory. The Sioux were now to be seen flying to more distant covers with the same eagerness and desperation as, a few moments before, they had been plunging into the fight. The triumphant Pawnees bounded forward in chase like so many high-blooded and well-trained hounds. On every side were heard the cries of victory or the yell of revenge. A few of the fugitives endeavored to bear away the bodies of their fallen warriors, but the hot pursuit quickly compelled them to abandon the slain in order to preserve the living. Among all the struggles which were made on that occasion, 
to guard the honour of the Sioux from the stain which their peculiar opinions attached to the possession of the scalp of a fallen brave, but one solitary instance of success occurred. The opposition of a particular chief to the hostile proceedings in the councils of that morning has been already seen. But, after having raised his voice in vain, in support of peace, his arm was not backward in doing its duty in the war. His proudness had been mentioned, and it was chiefly by his courage and example that the Tetons sustained themselves in the heroic manner they did when the death of Maturi was known. This warrior, who, in the figurative language of his people, was called the Swooping Eagle, had been the last to abandon the hopes of victory. When he found that the support of the dreaded rifle had robbed his band of the hard-earned advantages, he sullenly retired amid a shower of missiles to the secret spot where he had hid his horse in the mazes of the highest grass. Here he found a new and an entirely unexpected competitor, ready to dispute with him for the possession of the beast. It was Bacardina, the aged friend of Maturi, he whose voice had been given in opposition to his own wiser opinions, transfixed with an arrow, and evidently suffering under the pangs of approaching death. "'I have been on my last warpath,' said the grim old warrior, when he found that the real owner of the animal had come to claim his property. "'Shall a Pawnee carry the white hairs of a Sioux into his village to be a scorn to his women and children?' The other grasped his hand, answering to the appeal with the stern look of inflexible resolution. With this silent pledge he assisted the wounded man to mount. So soon as he had led the horse to the margin of the cover, he threw himself also on its back, and securing his companion to his belt, he issued on the open plain, trusting entirely to the well-known speed of the beast for their mutual safety. The Pawnees were not long in catching a view of these new objects, and several turned their steeds to pursue. The race continued for a mile without a murmur from the sufferer, though in addition to the agony of his body, he had the pain of seeing his enemies approach at every leap of their horses. Stop, he said, raising a feeble arm to check the speed of his companion. The eagle of my tribe must spread his wings wider. Let him carry the white hairs of an old warrior into the burnt wood village. Few words were necessary between men who were governed by the same feelings of glory, and who were so well trained in the principles of their romantic honour. The swooping eagle threw himself from the back of the horse, and assisted the other to alight. The old man raised his tottering frame to its knees, and first casting a glance upward at the countenance of his countryman, as if to bid him adieu, he stretched out his neck to the blow he himself invited. A few strokes of the tomahawk, with a circling gash of the knife, sufficed to sever the head from the less valued trunk. The Teton mounted again, just in season to escape a flight of arrows which came from his eager and disappointed pursuers. Flourishing the grim and bloody visage, he darted away from the spot with a shout of triumph, and was seen scouring the plains, as if he were actually borne along on the wings of the powerful bird from whose qualities he had received his flattering name. The swooping eagle reached his village in safety. He was one of the few Sioux who escaped from the massacre of that fatal day, and for a long time he alone of the saved was able to lift his voice in the councils of his nation with undiminished confidence. The knife and the lance cut short the retreat of the larger portion of the vanquished. Even the retiring party of the women and children were scattered by the conquerors, and the sun had long sunk behind the rolling outline of the western horizon before the fell business of that disastrous defeat was entirely ended. End of chapter 30《Chapter Thirty One of the Prairie by James Fenimore Cooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Peck. Which is the merchant here, and which the Jew? Shakespeare. The day dawned the following morning on a more tranquil scene. The work of blood had entirely ceased, and as the sun arose, its light was shed on a broad expanse of quiet and solitude. The tents of Ishmael were still standing, where they had been last seen, but not another vestige of human existence could be traced in any other part of the waste. Here and there little flocks of ravenous birds were sailing and screaming above those spots where some heavy-footed Teton had met his death, 
but every other sign of the recent combat had passed away. The river was to be traced far through the endless meadows, by its serpentine and smoking bed, and the little silvery clouds of vapour, which hung above the pools and springs, were beginning to melt in air, as they felt the quickening warmth, which, pouring from the glowing sky, shed its bland and subtle influence on every object of the vast and unshadowed region. The prairie was like the heavens after the passage of the gust, soft, calm, and soothing. It was in the midst of such a scene that the family of the squatter assembled to make their final decision concerning the several individuals who had been thrown into their power by the fluctuating chances of the incidents related. Every being possessing life and liberty had been afoot since the first streak of grey had lighted the east, and even the youngest of the erratic brood seemed conscious that the moment had arrived when circumstances were about to transpire that might leave a lasting impression on the wild fortunes of the semi-barbarous condition. Ishmael moved through his little encampment with the seriousness of one who had been unexpectedly charged with matters of a gravity, exceeding any of the ordinary occurrences of his irregular existence. His sons, however, who had so often found occasions to prove the inexorable severity of their father's character, saw, in his sullen mien and cold eye, rather a determination to adhere to his resolutions, which usually were as obstinately enforced as they were harshly conceived, than any evidences of wavering or doubt. Even Esther was sensibly affected by the important matters that pressed so heavily on the interests of her family, while she neglected none of those domestic offices, which would probably have proceeded under any conceivable circumstances, just as the world turns round with earthquakes rending its crust, and volcanoes consuming its vitals, yet her voice was pitched to a lower and more foreboding key than common, and the still frequent chidings of her children were tempered by something like milder dignity of parental authority. Abram, as usual, seemed the one most given to solicitude and doubt. There were certain misgivings in the frequent glances that he turned on the unyielding countenance of Ishmael, which might have betrayed how little of their former confidence and good understanding existed between them. His looks appeared to be vacillating between hope and fear. At times his countenance lighted with the gleamings of a sordid joy, as he bent his look on the tent which contained his recovered prisoner, and then, again, the impression seemed unaccountably chased away by the shadows of intense apprehension. When under the influence of the latter feeling, his eye never failed to seek the visage of his dull and impenetrable kinsman. But there he rather found reason for alarm than grounds of encouragement for the whole character of the squatter's countenance expressed the fearful truth that he had redeemed his dull faculties from the influence of the kidnapper, and that his thoughts were now brooding only on the achievement of his own stubborn intentions. It was in this state of things that the sons of Ishmael, in obedience to an order from their father, conducted the several subjects of his contemplated decisions from their places of confinement into the open air. No one was exempted from this arrangement. Middleton and Inez, Paul and Owen, Obed and the Trapper, were all brought forth, and placed in situations that were deemed suitable to receive the sentence of their arbitrary judge. The younger children gathered around the spot, in momentary but engrossing curiosity, and even Esther quitted her culinary labors, and drew nigh to listen. Hardheart alone, of all his band, was present to witness the novel and far from unopposing spectacle. He stood leaning gravely on his lance, while the smoking steed, that grazed nigh, showed that he had ridden far and hard to be a spectator on the occasion. Ishmael had received his new ally with a coldness that showed his entire insensibility to that delicacy, which had induced the young chief to come alone, in order that the presence of his warriors might not create uneasiness or distrust. He neither courted their assistance, nor dreaded their enmity, and he now proceeded to the business of the hour with as much composure as if the species of patriarchal power he wielded was universally recognized. There is something elevating in the possession of authority, however it may be abused. The mind is apt to make some efforts to prove the fitness between its qualities and the condition of its owner, though it may often fail, and render that ridiculous which was only hated before. But the effect on Ishmael Bush was not so disheartening. Grave in exterior, saturn by temperament, formidable by his physical means, and dangerous from his lawless obstinacy, his self-constituted tribunal, 
excited a degree of awe to which even the intelligent Middleton could not bring himself to be entirely insensible. Little time, however, was given to arrange his thoughts, for the squatter, though unaccustomed to haste, having previously made up his mind, was not disposed to waste the moments in delay. When he saw that all were in their places, he cast a dull look over his prisoners, and addressed himself to the captain as the principal man among the imaginary delinquents. I am called upon this day to fill the office which in the settlements you give unto judges, who are set apart to decide on matters that arise between man and man. I have but little knowledge of the ways of the courts, though there is a rule that is known unto all, and which teaches that an eye must be returned for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. I am no troubler of county houses, and least of all do I like living on a plantation that the sheriff has surveyed. Yet there is reason in such a law, that makes it a safe rule to journey by, and therefore it are a solemn fact, that this day shall I abide by it, and give unto all and each that which is his due, and no more. When Ishmael had delivered his mind thus far, he paused and looked about him, as if he would trace the effects in the countenances of his hearers. When his eye met that of Middleton, he was answered by the latter. If the evil doer is to be punished, and he that has offended, none to be left to go at large, you must change situations with me, and become a prisoner instead of a judge. You mean to say that I have done you wrong in taking the lady from her father's house, and leading her so far against her will into these wild districts? returned the unmoved squatter, who manifested as little resentment as he betrayed compunction at the charge. I shall not put the lie on the back of an evil deed, and deny your words. Since things have come to this pass between us, I have found time to think the matter over at my leisure, and though none of your swift thinkers, who can see, or who pretend to see, into the nature of all things, by a turn of the eye, yet am I a man open to reason, and give me my time, one who is not given to deny the truth. Therefore have I mainly concluded that it was a mistake to take a child from its parent, and a lady shall be returned whence she has been brought, as tenderly and as safely as man can do it. Ay, ay, added Esther, the man is right. Poverty and labor bore hard upon him, especially as county officers were getting troublesome, and in a weak moment he did the wicked act. But he has listened to my words, and his mind has got around again into its honest corner. An awful and a dangerous thing it is to be bringing the daughters of other people into a peaceable and well-governed family. And who will thank you for the same after what has been already done? muttered Abram, with a grin of disappointed cupidity, in which malignity and terror were disgustingly united. When the devil has once made out his account, you may look for your receipt in full only at his hands. Peace! said Ishmael, stretching his heavy hand towards his kinsman, in a manner that instantly silenced the speaker. Your voice is like a raven's in my ears. If you had never spoken, I should have been spared to shame. Since then you are beginning to lose sight of your errors and to see the truth, said Middleton. Do not things by halves, but by the generosity of your conduct. Purchase friends who may be of use in warding off any future danger from the law. Young man, interrupted the squatter with a dark frown. You too have said enough. If fear of the law had come over me, you would not be here to witness the manner in which Ishmael Bush deals out justice. Smother not your good intentions, and remember, if you contemplate violence to any among us, that the arm of that law you affect to despise reaches far, and that though its movements are sometimes slow, they are not the less certain. Yes, there is too much truth in his words, squatter said the trapper, whose attentive ears rarely suffered a syllable to be uttered unheeded in his presence. A busy and a troublesome arm it often proves to be here, in this land of America, where, as they say, man is left greatly to the following of his own wishes, compared to other countries, and happier. I am more manly and more honest, too, is he for the privilege. Why do you know, my men, that there are regions where the law is so busy as to say, in this fashion shall you live? in that fashion shall you die and in such another fashion shall you take leave of the world to be sent before the judgment seat of the lord a wicked and a troublesome meddling is that with the business of one who has not made his creatures to be herded like oxen and driven from field to field as their stupid and selfish keepers may judge of their need and wants 
a miserable land must that be, where they fetter the mind as well as the body, and where the creatures of God, being born children, are kept so by the wicked inventions of men, who would take upon themselves the office of the great governor of all. During the delivery of this pertinent opinion, Ishmael was content to be silent, though the look with which he regarded the speaker manifested any other feeling than that of amity. When the old man was done, he turned to Middleton and continued the subject which the other had interrupted. "'As to ourselves, young captain, there has been wrong on both sides. If I have borne hard upon your feelings and taken away your wife with an honest intention of giving her back to you, when the plans of that devil incarnate were answered, so have you broken into my encampment, aiding and abetting, as they have called many an honester bargain, in destroying my property. But what I did was to liberate the matters subtle between us.' interrupted Ishmael, with the air of one who, having made up his own opinion on the merits of the question, cared very little for those of other people. You and your wife are free to go and come, when and how you please. Abner, set the captain at liberty, and now, if you will tarry until I am ready to draw nigher to the settlements, you shall both have the benefit of carriage. If not, never say that you do not get a friendly offer. Now, may the strong oppress me and my sins be visited harshly on my own head if i forget your honesty however slow it has been in showing itself cried middleton hastening to the side of the weeping inez the instant he was released and friend i pledge you the honour of a soldier that your own part of this transaction shall be forgotten whatever i may deem fit to have done when i reach a place where the arm of government can make itself felt the dull smile with which the squatter answered to this assurance proved how little he valued the pledge that the youth, in the first revulsion of his feelings, was so free to make. "'Neither fear nor favour, but what I call justice, has brought me to this judgment,' he said. "'Do you that which may seem right in your eyes, and believe that the world is wide enough to hold us both, without our crossing each other's path again. If you are content, well, and if you are not content, seek to ease your feelings in your own fashion. I shall not ask to be let up, when you once put me fairly down.' And now, doctor, have I come to your leave in my accounts. It is time to foot up the small reckoning that has been running on for some time atwixt us. With you I entered into open and manly faith. In what manner have you kept it? The singular felicity with which Ishmael had contrived to shift the responsibility of all that had passed, from his own shoulders to those of his prisoners, backed as it was by circumstances that hardly admitted of a very philosophical examination of any mooted point in ethics, was sufficiently embarrassing to the several individuals who were so unexpectedly required to answer for a conduct which, in their simplicity, they had deemed so meritorious. The life of Obed had been so purely theoretic that his amazement was not the least embarrassing at a state of things which might not have proved so very remarkable had he been a little more practised in the ways of the world. The worthy naturalist was not the first by many, who found himself, at the precise moment when he was expecting praise, suddenly arraigned, to answer for the very conduct on which he rested all his claims to commendation. Though not a little scandalized, at the unexpected turn of the transaction, he was fain to make the best of circumstances, and to bring forth such matter in justification as first presented itself to his disordered faculties that there did exist a certain compactum or agreement between Obed Bat, M.D., and Ishmael Bush, Viator, or Erratic Husbandman, he said, endeavouring to avoid all offence in the use of terms. I am not disposed to deny. I will admit that it was therein conditioned or stipulated that a certain journey should be performed conjointly or in company until so many days have been numbered, but as the said time has fully expired, I presume it fair to infer that the bargain may now be said to be obsolete. Ishmael, interrupted the impatient Esther, make no words with a man who can break your bones as easily as set them, and let the poisoning devil go. He's a cheat from box to file. Give him half the prairie, and take the other half yourself. He, an acclimator, I will engage to get the brats acclimated to a fever and rag you bottom in a week and not a word shall be uttered harder to pronounce than the bark of a cherry tree, with perhaps a drop or two of western comfort. One thing are a fact, Ishmael. I like no fellow travellers who can give a heavy feel to an honest woman's tongue, ay, and that without caring whether her household is in order or out of order. The air of settled gloom which had taken possession of the squatter's countenance lighted for an instant with a look of dull drollery as he answered. 
Different people might judge differently, Esther, of the virtue of the man's art. But since it is your wish to let him depart, I will not plough the prairie to make the walking rough. Friend, you are at liberty to go into the settlements, and there I would advise you to tarry, as men like me who make but few contracts do not relish the custom of breaking them so easily. And now, Ishmael, resumed his conquering wife, in order to keep a quiet family and to smother all heart-burnings between us, show yonder Redskin and his daughter, pointing to the aged La Belle Affair and the widowed Tekahana, the way to their village, and let us say to them, God bless you, and farewell in the same breath. They are the captives of the Pawnee, according to the rules of Indian warfare, and I cannot meddle with his rights. Beware the devil, my man. He's a cheat and a tempter, and none can say they are safe with his awful delusions before their eyes. Take the advice of one who has the honor of your name at heart, and send the tawny Jezebel away. The squatter laid his broad hand on her shoulder, and looking her steadily in the eye, he answered in tones that were both stern and solemn. Woman! We have before us which cause our thoughts to other matters than the follies you mean. Remember what is to come, and put your silly jealousy to sleep. It is true, it is true, murmured his wife, moving back among her daughters. God forgive me that I should forget it. And now, young man, you, who have so often come into my clearing, under the pretense of lining the bee into his hole— resumed Ishmael, after a momentary pause, as if to recover the equilibrium of his mind. With you there is a heavier account to settle. Not satisfied with rummaging my camp, you have stolen a girl who is akin to my wife, and who I had calculated to make one day a daughter of my own. A stronger sensation was produced by this than by any of the preceding interrogations. All the young men bent their curious eyes on Paul and Ellen, the former of whom seemed in no small mental confusion, while the latter bent her face on her bosom in shame. "'Hark ye, friend, Ishmael Bush,' returned the bee-hunter, who found that he was expected to answer to the charge of burglary, as well as to that of abduction. "'That I did not give the most civil treatment to your pots and pails, I am not going to gainsay. If you will name the price you put upon the articles, it is possible the damage may be quietly settled between us, and all hard feelings forgotten.' I was not in a church-going humor when we got upon your rock, and it is more than a probable that there were quite as much kicking as preaching among your wares. But a hole in the best man's coat can be mended by money. As to the matter of Ellen Wade here, it may not be got over so easily. Different people have different opinions on the subject of matrimony. Some think it is enough to say yes and no to the questions of the magistrate or of the parson, if one happens to be handy, in order to make a quiet house." but I think that where a young woman's mind is fairly bent on going in a certain direction, it will be quite as prudent to let her body follow. Not that I mean to say Ellen was not altogether forced to what she did, and therefore she is just as innocent in this matter as yonder jackass who was made to carry her, and greatly against his will too, as I am ready to swear he would say himself if he could speak as loud as he can bray. Nelly, resumed the squatter, who paid very little attention to what Paul considered a highly credible and ingenious vindication. Noe, this is a wide and wicked world on which you have been in such a hurry to cast yourself. You have fed and you have slept in my camp for a year, and I did hope that you had found the free air of the borders enough to your mind to wish to remain among us. Let the girl have her will, muttered Esther from the rear. He, who might have persuaded her to stay, is sleeping in the cold and naked prairie, and little hope is left of changing her humor. Besides, a woman's mind is a willful thing, and not easily turned from its waywardness, as you know yourself, my man, or I should not be here the mother of your sons and daughters. The squatter seemed reluctant to abandon his views of the abashed girl so easily, and before he answered to the suggestion of his wife, he turned his usual dull look along the line of the curious countenances of his boys as if to see whether there was not one among them fit to fill the place of the deceased. Paul was not slow to observe the expression, and hitting nigher than usual on the secret thoughts of the other, he believed he had fallen on an expedient which might remove every difficulty. "'It is quite plain, friend Bush,' he said, "'that there are two opinions in this manner, yours for your sons and mine for myself. I see but one amicable way of settling this dispute, which is as follows.' Do you make a choice among your boys of any of you will, and let us walk off together for the matter of a few miles into the prairies, 
The one who stays behind can never trouble any man's house or his fixin, and the one who comes back may make the best of his way he can in the good wishes of the young woman. Pa! exclaimed the reproachful but smothered voice of Ellen. Never fear, Nelly, whispered the literal bee-hunter, whose straight long mind suggested no other motive of uneasiness on the part of his mistress than concern for himself. I have taken the measure of them all, and you may trust an eye that has seen to line many a bee into his hole. I am not about to set myself up as a ruler of inclinations, observed the squatter. If the heart of the child is truly in the settlements, let her declare it. She shall have no let or hindrance from me. Speak, Nelly, and let what you say come from your wishes, without fear or favour. Would you leave us to go with this young man into the settled countries, or will you tarry and share the little we have to give? but which to you we give so freely. Thus called upon to decide, Ellen could no longer hesitate. The glance of her eye was at first timid and furtive, but as the colour flushed her features and her breathing became quick and excited, it was apparent that the native spirit of the girl was gaining the ascendancy over the bashfulness of sex. "'You took me a fatherless, impoverished, and friendless orphan,' she said, struggling to command her voice when others who live in what may be called affluence compared to your state chose to forget me and may heaven in its goodness bless you for it the little i have done will never pay you for that one act of kindness i like not your manner of life it is different from the ways of my childhood and it is different from my wishes still had you not led this sweet and unoffending lady from her friends i should never have quitted you until you yourself had said go and the blessing of god go with you the act was not wise, but it is repented of, and so far as it can be done, in safety, it shall be repaired. Now, speak freely. Will you tarry, or will you go? I have promised the lady, said Ellen, dropping her eyes again to the earth, not to leave her, and after she has received so much wrong from our hands, she may have a right to claim that I keep my word. Take the cords from the young man, said Ishmael. When the order was obeyed, he motioned for all his sons to advance, and he placed them in a row before the eyes of Ellen. Now, let there be no trifling, but open your heart. Here are all I have to offer, besides a hearty welcome. The distressed girl turned her abashed look from the countenance of one of the young men to that of another, until her eye met the troubled and working features of Paul. Then nature got the better of forms. She threw herself into the arms of the bee-hunter, and sufficiently proclaimed her choice by sobbing aloud. Ishmael signed to his sons to fail back, and evidently mortified, though perhaps not disappointed by the result, he no longer hesitated. "'Take her,' he said, "'and deal honestly and kindly by her. The girl has that in her which should make her welcome in any man's house, and I should be loth to hear she ever came to harm. And now I have settled with you all on terms that I hope you will not find hard, but, on the contrary, just and manly. I have only another question to ask.' and that is of the captain. Do you choose to profit by my teams in going into the settlements, or not? I hear that some soldiers of my party are looking for me near the villages of the Fawnies, said Middleton, and I intend to accompany this chief in order to join my men. Then, the sooner we part, the better. Horses are plenty on the bottom. Go, make your choice, and leave us in peace. That is impossible, while the old man, who has been a friend of my family near a half-century, is left the prisoner. What has he done, that he too is not released? Ask no questions that may lead to deceitful answers, sullenly returned the squatter. I have dealings of my own with that trapper, that it may not befit an officer of the States to meddle with. Go, while your road is open. The man may be giving you honest counsel, and that which it concerns you all to hearken to, observed the old captive, who seemed in no uneasiness at the extraordinary condition in which he found himself. The Sioux are a numberless and bloody-minded race, and no one can say how long it may be afore they will be out again on the scent of revenge. Therefore I say to you, go also, and take a special heed in crossing the bottoms, that you get not entangled again in the fires, for the honest hunters often burn the grass at this season, in order that the buffaloes may find a sweeter and greener pasturage in the spring." I should forget not only my gratitude, but my duty to the laws were I to leave this prisoner in your hands, even by his own consent, without knowing the nature of his crime, in which we may all have been his innocent accessories. Will it satisfy you to know that he merits all he will receive? 
it will at least change my opinion of his character. Look then at this, said Ishmael, placing before the eyes of the captain the bullet that had been found about the person of the dead Asa. With this morsel of lead did he lay low as fine a boy as ever gave joy to a parent's eyes. I cannot believe that he had done this deed, unless in self-defense, or on some justifiable provocation. That he knew of the death of your son, I confess, for he pointed out the break in which the body lay, but that he has wrongfully taken his life, nothing but his own acknowledgment shall persuade me to believe. I have lived long, commenced the trapper, who found by the general pause that he was expected to vindicate himself from the heavy imputation. And much evil have I seen in my day. Many are the prowling bears and leaping panthers that I have met, fighting for the morsel which has been thrown in their way, and many are the reasoning men that I have looked on striving against each other until death, in order that human madness might also have its hour. For myself, I hope there is no boasting in saying that though my hand has been needed in putting down wickedness and oppression, it has never struck a blow of which its owner will be ashamed to hear at a reckoning that shall be far mightier than this. If my father has taken life from one of his tribe, said the young Pawnee, whose quick eye had read the meaning of what was passing in the bullet and in the countenances of the others, let him give himself up to the friends of the dead like a warrior. He is too just to need the thongs to lead him to judgment. Boy, I hope you do me justice. If I had done the foul deed with which they charge me, I should have manhood enough to come and offer my head to the blow of punishment, as all good and honest red men do the same. Then, giving his anxious Indian friend a look to reassure him of his innocence, he turned to the rest of his attentive and interested listeners as he continued in English. I have a short story to tell, and he that believes it will believe the truth, and he that disbelieves it will only lead himself astray, and perhaps his neighbor, too. We were all outlying about your camp, friend squatter, as by this time you may begin to suspect, when we found that it contained a wrong and imprisoned lady, with intentions neither more honest nor dishonest than to set her free, as in nature and justice she had a right to be seeing that i was more skilled in scouting than the others while they lay back in the cover i was sent upon the plain on the business of the reconnoiterings you little thought that one was so nigh who saw into all the circumventions of your hunt but there was i sometimes flat behind a bush or a tuft of grass sometimes rolling down a hill into a bottom and little did you dream that your motions were watched as the panther watches the drinking deer lord squatter when I was a man in the pride and strength of my days, I have looked in at the tent door of the enemy, and they sleeping, I, and dreaming too of being at home and in peace. I wish there was time to give you the part. Proceed with your explanation, interrupted Middleton. Ah, and a bloody and a wicked sight it was. There I lay in a low bed of grass as two of the hunters came nigh each other. Their meeting was not cordial, nor such as men who meet in a desert should give each other but I thought they would have parted in peace, until I saw one put his rifle to the other's back, and do what I call a treacherous and a sinful murder. It was a noble and a manly youth, that boy. Though the powder burnt his coat, he stood the shock for more than a minute, before he fell. Then was he brought to his knees, and a desperate and a manful fight he made to the break, like a wounded bear seeking a cover. And why, in the name of heavenly justice, did you conceal this? cried Middleton. What, think you, Captain, that a man who has spent more than threescore years in the wilderness has not learned the virtue of discretion? What red warrior runs to tell the sights he has seen until a fitting time? I took the doctor to the place in order to see whether his skill might not come in use, and our friend, the bee-hunter, being in company, was knowing to the fact that the bushes held the body. Aye, it are true, said Paul. But not knowing what private reasons might make the old trapper wish to hush the matter up, I said as little about the thing as possible, which was just nothing at all. And who was the perpetrator of this deed? demanded Middleton. If by perpetrator you mean him who did the act, yonder stands the man, and a shame and a disgrace it is to our race that he is of the blood and family of the dead. He lies, he lies, shrieked Abram. I did no murder. I gave but blow for blow. The voice of Ishmael was deep and even awful, as he answered, It is enough. Let the old man go. 
Boys, put the brother of your mother in his place. Touch me not, cried Abram. I call on God to curse you if you touch me. The wild and disordered gleam of his eye at first induced the young men to arrest their steps, but when Abner, older and more resolute than the rest, advanced full upon him, with a countenance that bespoke the hostile state of his mind, the affrighted criminal turned, and making an abortive effort to fly, fell, with his face to the earth, to all appearance perfectly dead. Amid the low exclamations of horror which succeeded, Ishmael made a gesture which commanded his sons to bear the body into the tent. Now, he said, turning to those who were strangers in his camp, nothing is left to be done, but for each to go his own road. I wish you all well, and to you, Ellen, though you may not prize the gift, I say, God bless you. Middleton, awestruck by what he believed a manifest judgment of heaven, made no further resistance, but prepared to depart. The arrangements were brief and soon completed. When they were all ready, they took a short and silent leave of the squatter and his family, and then the whole of the singularly constituted party were seen slowly and silently following the victorious Pawnee towards his distant villages. End of chapter 31Chapter thirty two of the Prairie by James Fenimore Cooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Peck. And I beseech you, rest once the law to your authority. To do a great right, do a little wrong. Shakespeare. Ishmael awaited long and patiently for the motley train of hard heart to disappear. When his scout reported that the last straggler of the Indians, who had joined their chief so soon as he was at such a distance from the encampment as to excite no jealousy by their numbers, had gone behind the most distant swell of the prairie, he gave forth the order to strike his tents. The cattle were already in the gears, and the movables were soon transferred to their usual places in the different vehicles. When all these arrangements were completed, the little wagon, which had so long been the tenement of Inez, was drawn before the tent into which the insensible body of the kidnapper had been borne, and preparations were evidently made for the reception of another prisoner. Then it was, as Abram appeared, pale, terrified, and tottering beneath a load of detected guilt, that the younger members of the family were first deprived that he still belonged to the class of the living. A general and superstitious impression had spread among them, and his crime had been visited by a terrible retribution from heaven, and they now gazed at him as at a being who belonged rather to another world than as a mortal who, like themselves, had still to endure the last agony before the great link of human existence could be broken. The criminal himself appeared to be in a state in which the most sensitive and startling terror was singularly combined with total physical apathy. The truth was, that while his person had been numbed by the shock, his susceptibility to apprehension kept his agitated mind in unrelieved distress. When he found himself in the open air, he looked about him, in order to gather, if possible, some evidences of his future fate from the countenances of those gathered around. Seeing everywhere grave but composed features, and meeting in no eye any expression that threatened immediate violence, the miserable man began to revive and, by the time he was seated in the wagon, his artful faculties were beginning to plot the expedients of pairing the just resentment of his kinsmen, or, if those should fail him, the means of escaping from a punishment that his forebodings told him would be terrible. Throughout the whole of these preparations, Ishmael rarely spoke. A gesture, or a glance of the eye, served to indicate his pleasure to his sons, and with these simple methods of communication, all parties appeared content. When the signal was made to proceed, the squatter threw his rifle into the hollow of his arm, and his axe across his shoulder, taking the lead as usual. Esther buried herself in the wagon which contained her daughters. The young men took their customary places among the cattle, or nigh the teams, and the whole proceeded, at their ordinary dull but unremitted gait. For the first time in many a day, the squatter turned his back towards the setting sun. The route he held was in the direction of the settled country, and the manner in which he moved sufficed to tell his children, who had learned to read their father's determinations in his mien, that their journey on the prairie was shortly to have an end. 
Still, nothing else transpired for hours that might denote the existence of any sudden or violent revolution in the purposes or feelings of Ishmael. During all that time he marched alone, keeping a few hundred rods in front of his teams, seldom giving any sign of extraordinary excitement. Once or twice, indeed, his huge figure was seen standing on the summit of some distant swell, with the head bent towards the earth as he leaned on his rifle, but then these moments of intense thought were rare, and of short continuance. The train had long thrown its shadows towards the east, before any material alteration was made in the disposition of their march. Watercourses were waded, plains were passed, and rolling ascents risen and descended, without producing the smallest change. Long practice in the difficulties of that peculiar species of travelling in which he was engaged, the squatter avoided the more impracticable obstacles of their route by a sort of instinct, invariably inclining to the right or left in season, as the formation of the land, the presence of trees, or the signs of rivers, forewarned him of the necessity of such movements. At length the hour arrived when charity to man and beast required a temporary suspension of labour. Ishmael's chose the required spot with his customary sagacity. The regular formation of the country, such as it had been described in the earlier pages of our book, had long been interrupted by a more unequal and broken surface. There were, it is true, in general, the same wide and empty wastes, the same rich and extensive bottoms, in that wild and singular combination of swelling fields and of nakedness, which gives that region the appearance of an ancient country, incomprehensibly stripped of its people and their dwellings. But these distinguishing features of the rolling prairies had long been interrupted by irregular hillocks, occasional masses of rock, and broad belts of forest. Ishmael chose a spring that broke out of the base of a rock some forty or fifty feet in elevation as a place well suited to the wants of his herds. The water moistened a small swale that lay beneath the spot, which yielded, in return for the fecund gift, a scanty growth of grass. A solitary willow had taken root in the alluvian, and profiting by its exclusive possession of the soil, the tree had sent up its stem far above the crest of the adjacent rock, whose peak summit had once been shadowed by its branches. But its loveliness had gone with the mysterious principle of life. As if in mockery of the meagre show of verdure that the spot exhibited, it remained a noble and solemn monument of former fertility. The larger, ragged, and fantastic branches still obtruded themselves abroad, while the white and hoary trunk stood naked and tempest-riven. Not a leaf nor a sign of vegetation was to be seen about it, in all things it proclaimed the frailty of existence and the fulfillment of time. Here Ishmael, after making the customary signal for the train to approach, threw his vast frame upon the earth and seemed to muse on the deep responsibility of his present situation. His sons were not long in arriving, for the cattle no sooner scented the food and water than they quickened their pace, and then succeeded the usual bustle and avocations of a halt. The impression made by the scene of that morning was not so deep, or lasting, on the children of Ishmael and Esther as to induce them to forget the wants of nature. But while the sons were searching among their stores, for something substantial to appease their hunger, and the younger fry were wrangling about their simple dishes, the parents of the unnurtured family were differently employed. When the squatter saw that all, even to the reviving Abram, were busy in administering to their appetites, he gave his downcast partner a glance of his eye, and withdrew towards a distant row of the land, which bounded the view towards the east. The meeting of the pair in this naked spot was like an interview held above the grave of their murdered son. Ishmael signed to his wife to take a seat beside him on a fragment of rock, and then followed a space during which neither seemed disposed to speak. "'We have journeyed together long, through good and bad,' Ishmael at length commenced, much have we had to try us, and some bitter cups have we been made to swallow, my woman, but nothing like this has ever before lain in my path. It is a heavy crust for a poor, misguided, and sinful woman to bear, returned Esther, bowing her head to her knees, and partly concealing her face in her dress. A heavy and burdensome weight is this to be laid upon the shoulders of a sister and a mother. Ay, therein lies the hardship of the case. I had brought my mind to the punishment of that houseless trapper, with no great strivings, 
for the man had done me few favours, and God forgive me if I suspected him wrongfully of much evil. This is, however, bringing shame in at one door of my cabin, in order to drive it out at the other. But shall a son of mine be murdered, and he who did it go at large? The boy would never rest. Oh, Ishmael, we pushed the matter far. Had little been said, who would have been the wiser? Our consciences might then have been quiet. Esther, said the husband, turning on her a reproachful but still a dull regard, the hour has been, my woman, when you thought another hand had done this wickedness. I did, I did, the Lord gave me the feeling, as a punishment for my sins, but his mercy was not slow in lifting the veil. I looked into the book, Ishmael, and there I found the words of comfort. Have you that book at hand, woman? It may happen to advise in such a dreary business. Esther fumbled in her pocket, and was not long in producing the fragment of a Bible, which had been thumbed and smoke-dried till the print was nearly illegible. It was the only article in the nature of a book that was to be found among the chattels of the squatter, and it had been preserved by his wife as a melancholy relic of more prosperous and, possibly, of more innocent days. She had long been in the habit of resorting to it, under the pressure of such circumstances as were palpably beyond human redress, though her spirit and resolution rarely needed support under those that admitted of reparation through any of the ordinary means of reprisal. In this manner, Esther had made a sort of convenient ally of the word of God, rarely troubling it for counsel, however, except when her own incompetency to avert an evil was too apparent to be disputed. We shall leave causes to determine how far she resembled any other believers in this particular, and proceed directly with the matter before us. "'There are many awful passages in these pages, Ishmael,' she said, when the volume was open and the leaves were slowly turning under her finger, "'and some there are that teach the rules of punishment.' Her husband made a gesture for her to find one of those brief rules of conduct, which have been received among all Christian nations as the direct mandates of the Creator, and which have been found so just that even they, who deny their high authority, admit their wisdom. Ishmael listened with grave attention as his companion read all those verses, which her memory suggested, and which were thought applicable to the situation in which they found themselves. He made her show him the words, which he regarded with a sort of strange reverence. A resolution once taken was usually irrevocable in one who was moved with so much difficulty. He put his hand upon the book and closed the pages himself, as much as to apprise his wife that he was satisfied. Esther, who so well knew his character, trembled at the action, and casting a glance at his steady eye, she said, And yet, Ishmael, my blood and the blood of my children is in his veins. Cannot mercy be shown? Woman, he answered sternly, when we believed that miserable old trapper had done this deed, nothing was said of mercy. Esther made no reply, but folding her arms upon her breast, she sat silent and thoughtful for many minutes. Then she once more turned her anxious gaze upon the countenance of her husband, where she found all passion and care apparently buried in the coldest apathy. Satisfied now that the fate of her brother was sealed, and possibly conscious how well he merited the punishment that was meditated, she no longer thought of mediation. No more words passed between them. Their eyes met for an instant, and then both arose and walked in profound silence towards the encampment. The squatter found his children expecting his return in the usual listless manner with which they awaited all coming events. The cattle were already herded, and the horses in their gears, in readiness to proceed, so soon as he should indicate that such was his pleasure. The children were already in their proper vehicle, and in short nothing delayed the departure but the absence of the parents of the wild brood. "'Abner,' said the father, with the deliberation with which all his proceedings were characterized, "'take the brother of your mother from the wagon, and let him stand on the earth.' Abram issued from his place of concealment, trembling, it is true, but far from destitute of hopes, as to his final success in appeasing the just resentment of his kinsman. After throwing a glance around him, with the vain wish of finding a single countenance in which he might detect a solitary gleam of sympathy, he endeavoured to smother those apprehensions that were by this time reviving in their original violence, by forcing a sort of friendly communication between himself and the squatter. "'The beasts are getting jaded, brother,' he said, and as we have made so good a march already, 
is it not time to camp? To my eye, you may go far, before a better place than this is found to pass the night in. "'Tis well you like it. Your tarry here are likely to be long. My sons, draw nigh and listen. Abram White, he added, lifting his cap and speaking with a solemnity and steadiness that rendered even his dull mien imposing. You have slain my firstborn, and according to the laws of God and man must you die. The kidnapper started at this terrible and sudden sentence, with the terror that one would exhibit who unexpectedly found himself in the grasp of a monster, from whose power there was no retreat. Although filled with the most serious forebodings of what might be his lot, his courage had not been equal to look his danger in the face, and with the deceitful consolation with which timid tempers are apt to conceal their desperate condition from themselves, he had rather courted a treacherous relief in his cunning than prepared himself for the worse. Die, he repeated, in a voice that scarcely issued from his chest. A man is surely safe among his kinsmen. So thought my boy, returned the squatter, motioning for the team that contained his wife and the girls to proceed, as he very coolly examined the priming of his piece. By the rifle did you destroy my son. It is fit and just that you meet your end by the same weapon. Abram stared about him with a gaze that bespoke an unsettled reason. He even laughed as if he would not only persuade himself but others that what he heard was some pleasantry intended to try his nerves. But nowhere did his frightful merriment meet with an answering echo. All round was solemn and still. The visages of his nephews were excited, but cold towards him, and that of his former confederate frightfully determined. This very steadiness of mien was a thousand times more alarming and hopeless than any violence could have proved. The latter might possibly have touched his spirit in awakened resistance, but the former threw him entirely on the feeble resources of himself. "'Brother,' he said in a hurried unnatural whisper, "'did I hear you?' "'My words are plain, Abram White. Thou hast done murder, and for the same must thou die.' "'Esther, sister, sister, will you leave me? Oh, sister, do you hear my call?' "'I hear one speak from the grave.' returned the husky tones of Esther, as the wagon passed the spot where the criminal stood. It is the voice of my firstborn calling aloud for justice. God have mercy, God have mercy on your soul. The team slowly pursued its route, and the deserted Abram now found himself deprived of the smallest vestige of hope. Still, he could not summon fortitude to meet his death, and had not his limbs refused to aid him, he would yet have attempted to fly. Then, by a sudden revolution from hope to utter despair, he fell upon his knees and commenced a prayer in which cries for mercy to God and to his kinsmen were wildly and blasphemously mingled. The sons of Ishmael turned away in horror at the disgusting spectacle, and even the stern nature of the squatter began to bend before so abject misery. "'May that which you ask of him be granted,' he said, "'but a father can never forget a murdered child.' He was answered by the most humble appeals for time. A week, a day, an hour were each implored, with an earnestness commiserate to the value they receive when a whole life is compressed into their short duration. The squatter was troubled, and at length he yielded in part to the petitions of the criminal. His final purpose was not altered, though he changed the means. "'Abner,' he said, "'mount the rock and look on every side, that we may be sure none are nigh.' While his nephew was obeying this order, gleams of reviving hope were seen shooting across the quivering features of the kidnapper. The report was favorable, nothing having life, the retiring teams accepted, was to be seen. A messenger was, however, coming from the latter, in great apparent haste. Ishmael awaited its arrival. He received from the hands of one of his wandering and frightened girls a fragment of that book which Esser had preserved with so much care. The squatter beckoned the child away, and placed the leaves in the hands of the criminal. "'Esther has sent you this,' he said, "'that in your last moments you may remember God.' "'Bless her, bless her! A good and kind sister has she been to me. But time must be given, that I may read time, my brother, time.' "'Time shall not be wanting. You shall be your own executioner, and this miserable office shall pass away from my hands.' Ishmael proceeded to put his new resolution in force. The immediate apprehensions of the kidnapper were quieted by an assurance that he might yet live for days, though his punishment was inevitable. A reprieve, 
to one abject and wretched as Abram, temporarily produced the same effects as a pardon. He was even foremost in assisting in the appalling arrangements, and of all the actors in that solemn tragedy, his voice alone was facetious and jocular. A thin shelf of the rock projected beneath one of the ragged arms of the willow. It was many feet from the ground, and admirably adapted to the purpose which, in fact, its appearance had suggested. On this little platform the criminal was placed, his arms bound at the elbows behind his back, beyond the possibility of liberation, with a proper cord leading from his neck to the limb of the tree. The latter was so placed that when suspended the body could find no foothold. The fragment of the Bible was placed in his hands, and he was left to seek his consolation as he might from its pages. "'And now, Abram White,' said the squatter, when his sons had descended from completing this arrangement, "'I give you a last and solemn asking.' Death is before you in two shapes. With this rifle can your misery be cut short, or, by that cord, sooner or later must you meet your end. Let me yet live. O oh, Ishmael, you know not how sweet life is when the last moment draws so nigh. Tis done, said the squatter, motioning for his assistants to follow the herds and teams. And now, miserable man, that it may prove a consolation to your end, I forgive you my wrongs and leave you to your God. Ishmael turned and pursued his way across the plain, at his ordinary sluggish and ponderous gait. Though his head was bent a little towards the earth, his inactive mind did not prompt him to cast a look behind. Once, indeed, he thought he heard his name called in tones that were a little smothered, but they failed to make him pause. At the spot where he and Esther had conferred, he reached the boundary of the visible horizon from the rock, here he stopped and ventured a glance in the direction of the place he had just quitted. The sun was near dipping into the plains beyond, and its last rays lighted the naked branches of the willow. He saw the ragged outline of the hole drawn against the glowing heavens, and he even traced the still upright form of the being he had left to his misery. Turning the roll of the swell, he proceeded with the feelings of one who had been suddenly and violently separated from a recent confederate forever. Within a mile the squatter overtook his teams, his sons had found a place suited to the encampment for the night, and merely awaited his approach to confirm their choice. Few words were necessary to express his acquiescence, everything passed in a silence more general and remarkable than ever. The chidings of Esther were not heard among her young, or if heard they were more in the tones of softened admonition than in her usual upbraiding key. No questions nor explanations passed between the husband and his wife. It was only as the latter was about to withdraw among her children for the night that the former saw her taking a furtive look at the pan of his rifle. Ishmael bade his son seek their rest, announcing his attention to look to the safety of the camp in person. When all was still, he walked out upon the prairie, with a sort of sensation that he found his breathing among the tents too straitened. The night was well adapted to heighten the feelings which had been created by the events of the day. The wind had risen with the moon, and it was occasionally sweeping over the plain, in a manner that made it not difficult for the sentinel to imagine strange and unearthly sounds were mingling in the blast. Yielding to the extraordinary impulses of which he was the subject, he cast a glance around to see that all were slumbering in security, and then he strayed towards the swell of land already mentioned. Here the squatter found himself at a point that commanded a view to the east and to the west. Light Fleecy clouds were driving before the moon, which was cold and watery, though there were moments when its placid rays were shed from clear blue fields, seeming to soften objects to its own mild loveliness. For the first time in a life of so much wild adventure, Ishmael felt a keen sense of solitude. The naked prairies began to assume the forms of illimitable and dreary waste, and the rushing of the wind sounded like the whisperings of the dead. It was not long before he thought a shriek was borne past him on a blast. It did not sound like a call from earth, but it swept frightfully through the upper air mingled with the hoarse accompaniment of the wind. The teeth of the squatter were compressed, and his huge hand grasped the rifle as if it would crush the metal. Then came a lull, a fresher blast, and a cry of horror that seemed to have been uttered at the very portals of his ears. A sort of echo burst involuntarily from his own lips, as men shout on their unnatural excitement, and throwing his rifle across his shoulder, he proceeded towards the rock with the strides of a giant. It was not often that the blood of Ishmael moved at the rate with which the fluid circulates in the veins of ordinary men, 
but now he felt it ready to gush from every pore in his body. The animal was aroused in his most latent energies. Ever, as he advanced, he heard those shrieks, which sometimes seemed ringing among the clouds, and sometimes passed so nigh as to appear to brush the earth. At length there came a cry in which there could be no delusion, or to which the imagination could lend no horror. It appeared to fill each cranny of the air, as the visible horizon is often charged to fullness by one dazzling flash of the electric fluid. The name of God was distinctly audible, but it was awfully and blasphemously blended with sounds that may not be repeated. The squatter stopped, and for a moment he covered his ears with his hands. When he withdrew the latter, a low and husky voice at his elbow asked in smothered tones, "'Ishmael, my man, heard ye nothing?' Hish, returned the husband, laying a powerful arm on Esther, without manifesting the smallest surprise at the unlooked-for presence of his wife. Hiss, woman! If you have the fear of heaven, be still! A profound silence succeeded. Though the wind rose and fell as before, its rushing was no longer mingled with those fearful cries. The sounds were imposing and solemn, but it was the solemnity and majesty of nature. Let us go on! said Esther, all is hushed. Woman, what has brought you here? demanded her husband, whose blood had returned to its former channels, and whose thoughts had already lost a portion of their excitement. Ishmael, he murdered our firstborn. But it is not meet that the son of my mother should lie upon the ground like the carrion of a dog. Follow, returned the squatter, again grasping his rifle and striding towards the rock. The distance was still considerable and their approach, as they drew nigh the place of execution, was moderated by all. Many minutes had passed before they reached the spot where they might distinguish the outlines of the dusky objects. "'Where have you put the body?' whispered Esther. "'See, here are pick and spade, that a brother of mine may sleep in the bosom of the earth.' The moon broke from behind a mass of clouds, and the eye of the woman was enabled to follow the finger of Ishmael. It pointed to a human form swinging in the wind, beneath the ragged and shining arm of the willow. Esther bent her head, and veiled her eyes from the sight. But Ishmael drew nigher, and long contemplated his work in awe, though not in compunction. The leaves of the sacred book were scattered on the ground, and even a fragment of the shelf had been displaced by the kidnapper in his agony. But all was now in the stillness of death. The grim and convulsed countenance of the victim was at times brought full into the light of the moon and again as the wind lulled the fatal rope drew a dark line across its bright disc the squatter raised his rifle with extreme care and fired the cord was cut and the body came lumbering to the earth a heavy and insensible mass until now esther had not moved nor spoken but her hand was not slow to assist in the labor of the hour the grave was soon dug it was instantly made to receive its miserable tenant as the lifeless form descended Esther, who sustained the head, looked up into the face of her husband with an expression of anguish, and said, "'Ishmael, my man, it is very terrible. I cannot kiss the corpse of my father's child.' The squatter laid his broad hand on the bosom of the dead, and said, "'Abram White, we all have need of mercy. From my soul do I forgive you. May God in heaven have pity on your sins.' The woman bowed her face and imprinted her lips long and fervently on the pallid forehead of her brother. After this came the falling clods and all the solemn sounds of filling a grave. Esther lingered on her knees, and Ishmael stood uncovered while the woman muttered a prayer. All was then finished. On the following morning the teams and herds of the squatter were seen pursuing their course towards the settlements. As they approached the confines of society, the train was blended among a thousand others. Though some of the numerous descendants of this peculiar pair were reclaimed from their lawless and semi-barbarous lives, the principles of the family themselves were never heard of more. End of chapter 32「Chapter 33 of the Prairie by James Fenimore Cooper This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Peck No leave take I, for I will ride, as far as land will let me by your side. Shakespeare 
The passage of the Pawnee to his village was interrupted by no scene of violence. His vengeance had been as complete as it was summary. Not even a solitary scout of the Sioux was left on the hunting grounds he was obliged to traverse, and of course the journey of Middleton's party was as peaceful as if made in the bosom of the States. The marches were timed to meet the weakness of the females. In short, the victors seemed to have lost every trace of ferocity with their success, and appeared disposed to consult the most trifling of the wants of that engrossing people, who were daily encroaching on their rights, and reducing the red men of the West from their state of proud independence to the condition of fugitives and wanderers. Our limits will not permit a detail of the triumphal entry of the conquerors. The exultation of the tribe was proportioned to its previous despondency. Mothers boasted of the honorable deaths of their sons. Wives proclaimed the honor and pointed to the scars of their husbands. And Indian girls rewarded the young braves with songs of triumph. The trophies of their fallen enemies were exhibited, as conquered standards are displayed in more civilized regions. The deeds of former warriors were recounted by the aged men, and declared to be eclipsed by the glory of this victory. While Hardhart himself, so distinguished for his exploits from boyhood to that hour, was unanimously proclaimed and reproclaimed the worthiest chief and the stoutest brave that the Wankanda had ever bestowed on his most favored children, the Pawnees of the Loop. Notwithstanding the comparative security in which Middleton found his recovered treasure, he was not sorry to see his faithful and sturdy artillerists standing among the throng, as he entered in the wild train, and lifting their voices in a martial shout to greet his return. The presence of this force, small as it was, removed every shadow of uneasiness from his mind. It made him master of his movements, gave him dignity and importance in the eyes of his new friends, and would enable him to overcome the difficulties of the wide region which still lay between the village of the Pawnees and the nearest fortress of his countrymen. A lodge was yielded to the exclusive possession of Inez and Ellen, and even Paul, when he saw an armed sentinel in the uniform of the States pacing before its entrance, was content to stray among the dwellings of the Redskins, prying with but little reserve into their domestic economy, commenting sometimes jocularly, sometimes gravely, and always freely, on their different expedients, or endeavouring to make the wondering housewives comprehend his quaint explanations of what he conceived to be the better customs of the whites. This inquiring and troublesome spirit found no imitators among the Indians. The delicacy and reserve of hard heart were communicated to his people. When every attention that could be suggested by their simple manners and narrow wants had been fulfilled, no intrusive foot presumed to approach the cabins devoted to the service of the strangers. They were left to seek their repose in the manner which most comported with their habits and inclinations. The songs and rejoicings of the tribe, however, ran far into the night, during the deepest hours of which the voice of more than one warrior was heard, recounting from the top of his lodge the deeds of his people and the glory of their triumphs. Everything having life, notwithstanding the excess of the night, was abroad with the appearance of the sun. The expression of exultation, which had so lately been seen on every countenance, was now changed to one better suited to the feeling of the moment. It was understood by all that the pale-faces who had befriended their chief were about to take their final leave of the tribe. The soldiers of Middleton, in anticipation of his arrival, had bargained with an unsuccessful trader for the use of his boat, which lay in the stream ready to receive its cargo, and nothing remained to complete the arrangements for the long journey. Middleton did not see this moment arrive entirely without distrust. The admiration with which Hardhart regarded Inez had not escaped his jealous eye any more than the lawless wishes of Matori. He knew the consummate manner in which a savage could conceal his designs, and he felt that it would be a culpable weakness to be unprepared for the worst. Secret instructions were therefore given to his men, while the preparations they made were properly masked behind the show of military parade, with which it was intended to signalize their departure. The conscience of the young soldier reproached him, when he saw the whole tribe accompanying his party to the margin of the stream, with unarmed hands and sorrowful countenances. They gathered in a circle around the strangers and their chief, and became not only peaceful, but highly interested observers of what was passing. As it was evident that Hardhart intended to speak, the former stopped and manifested their readiness to listen, the trapper performing the office of interpreter. 
Then the young chief addressed his people in the usual metaphorical language of an Indian. He commenced by alluding to the antiquity and renown of his own nation. He spoke of their success in the hunts and on the war-path, of the manner in which they had always known how to defend their rights and to chastise their enemies. After he had said enough to manifest his respect for the greatness of the loops and to satisfy the pride of the listeners, he made a sudden transition to the race of whom the strangers were members. He compared their countless numbers to the flights of migratory birds in the season of blossoms or in the fall of the year. With a delicacy that none know better to how to practice than an Indian warrior, he made no direct mention of the rapacious temper that so many of them had betrayed in their dealings with the red men. Feeling that the sentiment of distrust was strongly engrafted in the tempers of his tribe, he rather endeavored to soothe any just resentment they might entertain by indirect excuses and apologies. He reminded the listeners that even the Pawnee Loops had been obliged to chase many unworthy individuals from their villages. The Wakanda sometimes veiled his countenance from a red man. No doubt the great spirit of the pale-faces often looked darkly on his children, such as were abandoned to the worker of evil could never be brave or virtuous, let the color of the skin be what it might. He bade his young men look at the hands of the big knives. They were not empty, like those of hungry beggars. Neither were they filled with goods, like those of knavish traders. They were like themselves, warriors, and they carried arms which they knew well how to use. They were worthy to be called brothers. Then he directed the attention of all to the chief of the strangers, he was a son of their great white father. He had not come upon the prairies to frighten the buffaloes from their pastures, or to seek the game of the Indians. Wicked men had robbed him of one of his wives. No doubt she was the most obedient, the meekest, the loveliest of them all. They had only to open their eyes to see that his words must be true. Now that the white chief had found his wife, he was about to return to his own people in peace. He would tell them that the Pawnees were just, and there would be a line of wampum between the two nations. Let all his people wish the strangers a safe return to their towns. The warriors of the Loops knew both how to receive their enemies and how to clear the briars from the path of their friends. The heart of Middleton beat quick, as the young partisan alluded to the charms of Inez, and for an instant he cast an impatient glance at his little line of artillerists. But the chief from that moment appeared to forget he had ever seen so fair a being, his feelings, if he had any on the subject, were veiled behind the cold mask of Indian self-denial. He took each warrior by the hand, not forgetting the meanest soldier, but his cold and collected eye never wandered for an instant towards either of the females. Arrangements had been made for their comfort, with a prodigality and care that had not failed to excite some surprise in his young men, but in no other particular did he shock their manly pride by betraying any solicitude in behalf of the weaker sex. Footnote. Regarding partisan. The Americans and the Indians have adopted several words which each believe peculiar to the language of the others. Thus, squaw, papoose, or child, wigwam, etc., though it is doubtful whether they belonged at all to any Indian dialect, are much used by both white and red men in their intercourse. Many words are derived from the French in this species of prairie nomaic. Partisan, brave, and so on, are of the number. The leave-taking was gentle and imposing. Each male Pawnee was sedulous to omit no one of the strange warriors and his attentions, and of course the ceremony occupied some time. The only exception, and that was not general, was in the case of Dr. Battius. Not a few of the young men, it is true, were indifferent about lavishing civilities on one of so doubtful a profession, but the worthy naturalist found some consolation in the more matured politeness of the old men, who had inferred that though not of much use in war, the medicine of the big knives might possibly be made serviceable in peace. When all of Middleton's party had embarked, the trapper lifted a small bundle which had lain at his feet during the previous proceedings, and whistling Hector to his side, he was the last to take a seat. The artillerist gave the usual cheers, which were answered by a shout from the tribe, and then the boat was shoved into the current and began to glide swiftly down the stream. A long and amusing, if not a melancholy, silence succeeded this departure. It was first broken by the trapper, whose regret was not the least visible in his dejected and sorrowful eye. "'They are a valiant and honest tribe,' 
he said, that will I say boldly in their favour, and second only do I take them to be to that once mighty but now scattered people, the Delawares of the hills. Ah's me, Captain, if you had seen as much good and evil as I have seen in these nations of redskins, you would know of how much value was a brave and a simple-minded warrior. I know that some are to be found, who both think and say that an Indian is but little better than the beasts of these naked plains. But it is needful to be honest in oneself, to be a fitting judge of honesty in others. No doubt, no doubt they know their enemies, and little do they care to show to such any great confidence or love. It is the way of man, returned the captain, and it is probable they are not wanting in any of his natural qualities. No, no, it is little that they want, that nature has had to give, but as little does he know of the temper of a redskin, who has seen but one Indian, or one tribe, as he knows of the color of feathers, who has only looked upon a crow. Now, friend steersman, just give the boat a sheer towards yonder, low sandy point, and a favor will be granted at a short asking. "'For what?' demanded Middleton. "'We are now on the swiftest of the current, and by drawing to the shore we shall lose the force of the stream.' "'Your tarry will not be long,' returned the old man, applying his own hand to the execution of that which he had requested. The oarsmen had seen enough of his influence with their leader not to dispute his wishes, and before time was given for further discussion on the subject, the bow of the boat had touched the land. Captain, resumed the other, untying his little wallet with great deliberation, and even in a manner to show he found satisfaction in the delay. I wish to offer you a small matter of trade, no great bargain may hap, but still the best that one of whose hand the skill of the rifle has taken leave, and who has become no better than a miserable trapper can offer before we part. Part? was echoed from every mouth among those who had so recently shared his dangers and profited by his care what the devil old trapper do you mean to foot it to the settlements when here is a boat that will float the distance in half the time that the jackass the doctor has given the pawnee could trot along the same settlements boy it is long since i take my leave of the waste and wickedness of the settlements in the villages if i live in a clearing here it is one of the lord's making and i have no hard thoughts on the matter but never again shall I be seen running willfully into the danger of immoralities. I had not thought of parting, answered Middleton, endeavoring to seek some relief from the uneasiness he felt by turning his eyes on the sympathizing countenances of his friends. On the contrary, I had hoped and believed that you would have accompanied us below, where I give you a sacred pledge, nothing shall be wanting to make your days comfortable. Yes, lad, yes, you would do your endeavors. But what are the strivings of man against the working of the devil? I, if kind offers and good wishes could have done the thing, I might have been a congressman, or perhaps a governor, years agone. Your grandfather wished the same, and there are them still lying in the Otsego Mountains, as I hope, who would gladly have given me a palace for my dwelling. But what are riches without content? My time must now be short, at any rate and I hope it's no mighty sin for one who has acted his part honestly near ninety winters and summers to wish to pass the few hours that remain in comfort. If you think I have done wrong in coming thus far to quit you again, Captain, I will own the reason of the act without shame or backwardness. Though I have seen so much of the wilderness, it is not to be gainsaid that my feelings as well as my skin are white. Now it would not be a fitting spectacle that yonder pawnee loops should look upon the weakness of an old warrior, if weakness he should happen to show in parting forever from those he has reason to love, though he may not set his heart so strongly on them as to wish to go into the settlements in their company. Harky, old trapper, said Paul, clearing his throat with a desperate effort, as if determined to give his voice a clear exit. I have just one bargain to make. Since you talk of trading, which is neither more or less than this, I offer you, as my side of the business, one half of my shanty, nor do I much care if it be the biggest half, the sweetest and the purest honey that can be made of the wild locusts, always enough to eat, with now and then a mouthful of venison, or, for that matter, a morsel of buffalo's hump, seeing that I intend to push my acquaintance with the animal, in as good and as tidy cooking as can come from the hands of one like Ellen Wade here, who will shortly be Nelly somebody else, 
and altogether such general treatment as a decent man might be supposed to pay to his best friend, or for that matter, to his own father. In return for the same, you are to give us, at odd moments, some of your ancient traditions, perhaps a little wholesome advice on occasions, in small quantities at a time, and as much of your agreeable company as you please. It is well, it is well, boy, returned the old man, fumbling at his wallet. Honestly offered, and not unthankfully declined, but it cannot be. No, it can never be. Venerable venerator, said Dr. Battius, there are obligations which every man owes to society and to human nature. It is time that you should return to your countrymen to deliver up some of those stores of experimental knowledge that you have doubtless attained by so long a sojourn in the wilds, which, however they may be corrupted by preconceived opinions, will prove acceptable bequest to those whom, as you say, you must shortly leave for ever. Friend, physicianer, returned the trapper, looking the other steadily in the face as it would be no easy matter to judge of the temper of the rattler by considering the fashions of the moose so it would be hard to speak of the usefulness of one man by thinking too much of the deeds of another you have your gifts like others i suppose and little do i wish to disturb them but as to me the lord has made me for a doer and not a talker and therefore do i consider it no harm to shut my ears to your invitation it is enough interrupted Middleton. I have seen and heard so much of this extraordinary man as to know that persuasions will not change his purpose. First we will hear your request, my friend, and then we will consider what may be best done for your advantage. It is a small matter, Captain, returned the old man, succeeding at length in opening his bundle. A small and trifling matter is it, to what I once used to offer in the way of bargain, but then it is the best I have, and therein not to be despised. Here are the skins of four beavers that I took. It might be a month afore we met, and here is another from a raccoon that is of no great matter to be sure, but which may serve to make weight atween us. And what do you propose to do with them? I offer them in lawful barter. Them nays, the Sioux, the Lord forgive me for ever believing it was the Kanzas, have stolen the best of my traps and driven me altogether to makeshift inventions, which might foretell a dreary winter for me, should my time stretch into another season. I wish you, therefore, to take the skins, and to offer them to some of the trappers you will not fail to meet below in exchange for a few traps, and to send the same into the Pawnee village in my name. Be careful to have my mark painted on them, a letter N, with a hound's ear, and the luck of a rifle." There is no redskin who will then dispute my right, for all which trouble I have little more to offer than my thanks, unless my friend, the bee-hunter here, will accept of the raccoon and take on himself the special charge of the whole matter. If I do, may I be— The mouth of Paul was stopped by the hand of Owen, and he was obliged to swallow the rest of the sentence, which he did with a species of emotion that bore no small resemblance to the process of strangulation. Well, well— returned the old man meekly. I hope there is no heavy offence in the offer. I know that the skin of a raccoon is a small price, but then it was no mighty labour that I asked in return. You entirely mistake the meaning of our friend, interrupted Middleton, who observed that the bee-hunter was looking in every direction but the right one, and that he was utterly unable to make his own vindication. He did not mean to say that he declined the charge, but merely that he refused all compensation— it is unnecessary, however, to say more of this. It shall be my office to see that the debt we owe is properly discharged, and that all your necessities shall be anticipated. Anon, said the old man, looking up inquiringly into the other's face, as if to ask an explanation. It shall be all as you wish. Lay the skins with my baggage. We will bargain for you as for ourselves. Thank ye, thank ye, Captain. Your grandfather was of such free and generous mind. So much so, in truth, that those just people, the Delawares, call him the open hand. I wish now I was as used to be, in order that I might send in the lady a few delicate martins for her tippets and overcoats, just to show you that I know how to give courtesy for courtesy. But do not expect the same, for I am too old to give a promise. It will all be just as the Lord shall see fit. 
I can offer you nothing else, for I haven't lived so long in the wilderness not to know the scrupulous ways of a gentleman. Hark ye, old trapper, cried the bee-hunter, striking his own hand into the open palm which the other had extended, with a report but little below the crack of a rifle. I have just two things to say. Firstly, that the captain has told you my meaning better than I can myself. And secondly, if you want a skin, either for your private use or to send abroad, I have it at your service, and that is the skin of one paw hover. The old man returned the grasp he received, and opened his mouth to the utmost in his extraordinarily silent laugh. You couldn't have given such a squeeze, boy, when the Teton squalls were about you with their knives. Ah, you are in your prime, and in your vigor and happiness, if honesty lies in your path. Then the expression of his rugged features suddenly changed to a look of seriousness and thought. Come hither, lad, he said, leading the bee-hunter by a button to the land, and speaking apart in a tone of admonition and confidence. Much has passed between us on the pleasures and respectableness of a life in the woods or on the borders. I do not now mean to say that all you have heard is not true, but different tempers call for different employments. You have taken to your bosom there a good and kind child. It has become your duty to consider her as well as yourself in setting forth in life. You are a little given to skirting the settlements, but, to my poor judgment, the girl would be more like a flourishing flower in the sun of a clearing than in the winds of a prairie. Therefore forget anything you may have heard from me, which is nevertheless true, and turn your mind on the ways of the inner country." Paul could only answer with a squeeze that would have brought tears from the eyes of most men, but which produced no other effect on the indurated muscles of the other than to make him laugh and nod, as if he received the same as a pledge that the bee-hunter would remember his advice. The trapper then turned away from his rough but warm-hearted companion, and having called Hector from the boat, he seemed anxious still to utter a few words more. Captain, he at length resumed, I know when a poor man talks of credit, he deals in a delicate world, according to the fashions of the world, and when an old man talks of life, he speaks of that which he may never see. Nevertheless, there is one thing I will say, and that is not so much on my own behalf as on that of another person. Here is Hector, a good and faithful pup, that has long outlived the time of a dog, and like his master, he looks more to comfort now than to any deeds in running. But the creature has his feelings as well as a Christian. He has consorted latterly with his kinsmen there, in such a sort as to find great pleasure in his company, and I will acknowledge that it touches my feelings to part the pair so soon. If you will set a value on your hound, I will endeavour to send it to you in the spring, more especially should them same traps come safe to hand, or, if you dislike parting with the animal altogether, I will just ask you for his loan through the winter. I think I can see my pup will not last beyond that time for I have judgment in these matters, since many is the friend, both hound and redskin, that I have seen depart in my day, though the Lord have not yet seen fit to order his angels to sound forth my name. "'Take him! Take him!' cried Middleton. "'Take all or anything!' The old man whistled the younger dog to the land, and then he proceeded to the final adieu. Little was said on either side. The trapper took each person solemnly by the hand, and uttered something friendly and kind to all. Middleton was perfectly speechless, and was driven to effect busying himself among the baggage. Paul whistled with all his might, and even Obed took his leave with an effort that bore the appearance of desperate philosophical resolution. When he had made the circuit of the hole, the old man, with his own hands, shoved the boat into the current, wishing God to speed them. Not a word was spoken, nor a stroke of the oar given, until the travellers, bad floated past the knoll that hid the trapper from their view. He was last seen standing on the low point, leaning on his rifle, with Hector crouched at his feet, and the younger dog frisking along the sands in the playfulness of youth and vigour. End of chapter 33《Chapter 34 of the Prairie》by James Fenimore Cooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Peck. Methought I heard a voice. Shakespeare. The watercourses were at their height, 
and the boat went down the swift current like a bird. The passage proved prosperous and speedy. In less than a third of the time that would have been necessary for the same journey by land, it was accomplished by the favour of these rapid rivers, issuing from one stream into another as the veins of the human body communicate with the larger channels of life, they soon entered the grand artery of the western waters and landed safely at the very door of the father of Inez. The joy of Don Augustine and the embarrassment of the worthy father Ignatius may be imagined. The former wept and returned thanks to heaven. The latter returned thanks and did not weep. The mild provincials were too happy to raise any questions on the character of so joyful a restoration, and, by a sort of general consent, it soon came to be an admitted opinion that the bride of Middleton had been kidnapped by a villain, and that she was restored to her friends by human agency. There were, as respects this belief, certainly a few sceptics, but then they enjoyed their doubts in private, with that species of sublimated and solitary gratification that a miser finds in gazing at his growing but useless hordes. In order to give the worthy priest something to employ his mind, Middleton made him the instrument of uniting Paul and Ellen. The former consented to the ceremony, because he found that all his friends lay great stress on the matter. But shortly after he led his bride into the plains of Kentucky, under the pretense of paying certain customary visits to sundry members of the family of Hover. While there, he took occasion to have the marriage properly solemnized by a justice of peace of his acquaintance, in whose ability to forge the nuptial chain he had much more faith than in that of all the gownsmen within the pale of Rome. Ellen, who appeared conscious that some extraordinary preventus might prove necessary to keep one of so erratic a temper as her partner, within the proper matrimonial boundaries, raised no objections to these double knots, and all parties were content. The local importance Middleton had acquired by his union with the daughter of so affluent a proprietor as Don Augustine, united to his personal merit, attracted the attention of the government. He was soon employed in various situations of responsibility and confidence, which both served to elevate his character in the public estimation, and to afford the means of patronage. The bee-hunter was among the first of those to whom he saw fit to extend his favour. It was far from difficult to find situations suited to the abilities of Paul in the state of society that existed three and twenty years ago in those regions. The efforts of Middleton and Inez, in behalf of her husband, were warmly and sagaciously seconded by Ellen, and they succeeded, in process of time, in working a great and beneficial change in his character. He soon became a landholder, then a prosperous cultivator of the soil, and shortly after a town officer. By that progressive change in fortune, which in the Republic is often seen to be so singularly accompanied by a corresponding improvement in knowledge and self-respect, he went on from step to step until his wife enjoyed the maternal delight of seeing her children placed far beyond the danger of returning to that state from which both their parents had issued paul is actually at this moment a member of the lower branch of the legislature of the state where he has long resided and he is even notorious for making speeches that have a tendency to put that deliberative body in good humour and which as they are based on great practical knowledge suited to the condition of the country possess a merit that is much wanted in many more subtle and fine-spun theories that are daily heard in similar assemblies to issue from the lips of certain instinctive politicians but all these happy fruits were the results of much care and of a long period of time middleton who fills with a credit better suited to the difference in their educations a seat in a far higher branch of legislative authority is the source from which we have derived most of the intelligence necessary to compose our legend. In addition to what he has related of Paul, and of his own continued happiness, he has added a short narrative of what took place in a subsequent visit to the prairies, with which, as we conceive it, a suitable termination to what has gone before, we shall judge it wise to conclude our labors. In the autumn of the year that succeeded the season in which the preceding events occurred, the young man, still in the military service, found himself on the waters of the Missouri, at a point not far remote from the Pawnee towns. Released from any immediate calls of duty, and strongly urged to the measure by Paul, who was in his company, he determined to take horse, and cross the country to visit the partisan, and to inquire into the fate of his friend, the trapper. As his train was suited to his functions and rank, the journey was effected 
with the privations and hardships that are the accompaniments of all travelling in a wild, but without any of those dangers and alarms that marked his former passage through the same regions. When within a proper distance, he dispatched an Indian runner, belonging to a friendly tribe, to announce the approach of himself and party, continuing his route at a deliberate pace, in order that the intelligence might, as was customary, precede his arrival. To the surprise of the travellers, their message was unanswered. Hour succeeded hour, and mile after mile was passed, without bringing either the signs of an honourable reception, or the more simple assurances of a friendly welcome. At length the cavalcade, at whose head rode Middleton and Paul, descended from the elevated plain on which they had long been journeying to a luxuriant bottom, that brought them to the level of the village of the Loops. The sun was beginning to fall, and a sheet of golden light was spread over the placid plain, lending to its even surface those glorious tints and hues that the human imagination is apt to conceive forms the embellishment of still more imposing scenes. The verdure of the year yet remained, and herds of horses and mules were grazing peacefully in the vast natural pasture, under the keeping of vigilant Pawnee boys. Paul pointed out among them the well-known form of Asinus, sleek, fat, and luxuriating in the fullness of content, as he stood with reclining ears and closed eyelids, seemingly musing on the exquisite nature of his present indolent enjoyment. The root of the party led them at no great distance from one of those watchful youths who was charged with a trust heavy as the principal wealth of his tribe. He heard the trampling of the horses, and cast his eye aside, but instead of manifesting curiosity or alarm, his look instantly returned, whence it had been withdrawn, to the spot where the village was known to stand. "'There is something remarkable in all this,' muttered Middleton, half offended at what he conceived to be not only a slight to his rank, but offensive to himself personally. Yonder boy has heard of our approach, or he would not fail to notify his tribe, and yet he scarcely deigns to favor us with a glance. Look to your arms, men. It may be necessary to let these savages feel our strength. Therein, Captain, I think you're in an error, returned Paul. If honesty is to be met on the prairies at all, you will find it in our old friend Hartheart. Neither is an Indian to be judged of by the rules of a white. See? We are not altogether slighted, for here comes a party at last to meet us, though it is a little pitiful as to show and numbers. Paul was right in both particulars. A group of horsemen were at length seen wheeling round a little copse, and advancing across the plain directly towards them. The advance of this party was slow and dignified. As it drew nigh, the partisan of the loops was seen at its head, followed by a dozen younger warriors of his tribe. They were all unarmed nor did they even wear any of those ornaments or feathers, which are considered testimonials of respect to the guest an Indian receives, as well as evidence of his own importance. The meeting was friendly, though a little restrained on both sides. Middleton, jealous of his own consideration, no less than of the authority of his government, suspected some undue influence on the part of the agents of the Canadas, and, as he was determined to maintain the authority of which he was the representative, he felt himself constrained to manifest a hauteur that he was far from feeling. It was not so easy to penetrate the motives of the Pawnees. Calm, dignified, and yet far from repulsive, they set an example of courtesy, blended with reserve, that many a diplomatist of the most polished court might have strove in vain to imitate. In this manner the two parties continued their course to the town, Middleton had time, during the remainder of the ride, to revolve in his mind all the probable reasons which his ingenuity could suggest for this strange reception. Although he was accompanied by a regular interpreter, the chiefs made their salutations in a manner that dispensed with his services. Twenty times the captain turned his glance on his former friend, endeavouring to read the expression of his rigid features. But every effort in all conjectures proved equally futile. The eye of Hardheart was fixed, composed, and a little anxious, but as to every other emotion, impenetrable. He neither spoke himself, nor seemed willing to invite discourse in his visitors. It was therefore necessary for Middleton to adopt the patient manners of his companions, and to await the issue for the explanation. When they entered the town, its inhabitants were seen collected in an open space, where they were arranged with the customary deference to age and rank. The whole formed a large circle, in the centre of which were perhaps a dozen of the principal chiefs. Hardheart waved his hand as he approached, 
and, as the mass of bodies opened, he rode through, followed by his companions. Here they dismounted, and as the beasts were led apart, the strangers found themselves environed by a thousand grave, composed, but solicitous faces. Middleton gazed about him, in growing concern, for no cry, no song, no shout welcomed him among a people from whom he had so lately parted with regret. His uneasiness, not to say apprehensions, was shared by all his followers. Determination and stern resolution began to assume the place of anxiety in every eye, as each man silently felt for his arms and assured himself that his several weapons were in a state for service. But there was no answering symptom of hostility on the part of their host. Hardheart beckoned for Middleton and Paul to follow, leading the way towards the cluster of forms that occupied the centre of the circle. Here the visitors found a solution of all the movements which had given them so much reason for apprehension. The trapper was placed on a rude seat, which had been made, with studied care, to support his frame in an upright and easy attitude. The first glance of the eye told his former friends that the old man was at length called upon to pay the last tribute of nature. His eye was glazed, and apparently as devoid of sight as of expression. His features were a little more sunken and strongly marked than formerly, but there all change, so far as exterior was concerned, might be said to have ceased. His approaching end was not to be ascribed to any positive disease, but had been a gradual and mild decay of the physical powers. Life, it is true, still lingered in his system, but it was as if, at times, entirely ready to depart, and then it would appear to reanimate the sinking form, reluctant to give up the possession of a tenement that had never been corrupted by vice or undermined by disease. It would have been no violent fancy to have imagined that the spirit fluttered about the placid lips of the old woodsman, reluctant to depart from a shell that had so long given it an honest and an honorable shelter. His body was placed so as to let the light of the setting sun fall full upon the solemn features. His head was bare, the long, thin locks of gray fluttering lightly in the evening breeze. His rifle lay upon his knee, and the other accoutrements of the chase were placed at his side, within reach of his hand. Between his feet lay the figure of a hound, with its head crouching to the earth as if it slumbered, and so perfectly easy and natural was its position that a second glance was necessary to tell Middleton he saw only the skin of Hector stuffed by Indian tenderness and ingenuity in a manner to represent the living animal. His own dog was playing at a distance with the child of Takahana and Matori. The mother herself stood at hand, holding in her arms a second offspring that might boast of a parentage no less honorable than that which belonged to the son of Hartheart. La Balafere was seated nigh the dying trapper, with every mark about his person, that the hour of his own departure was not far distant. The rest of those immediately in the center were aged men who had apparently drawn near in order to observe the manner in which a just and fearless warrior would depart on the greatest of his journeys. The old man was reaping the rewards of a life remarkable for temperance and activity, in a tranquil and placid death. His vigor, in a manner, endured to the very last. Decay, when it did occur, was rapid, but free from pain. He had hunted with the tribe in the spring, and even throughout most of the summer, when his limbs suddenly refused to perform their customary offices. A sympathizing weakness took possession of all his faculties, and the Pawnees believed that they were going to lose, in this unexpected manner, a sage and counselor, whom they had begun to love and respect. But as we have already said, the immortal occupant seemed unwilling to desert its tenement. The lamp of life flickered without becoming extinguished, on the morning of the day on which Middleton arrived, there was a general reviving of the powers of the whole man. His tongue was again heard in wholesome maxims, and his eye from time to time recognized the persons of his friends. It merely proved to be a brief and final intercourse with the world on the part of one who had already been considered as to mental communion to have taken his leave of it forever. When he had placed his guests in front of the dying man, Hardheart, after a pause, that proceeded as much from sorrow as decorum, leaned a little forward, and demanded, "'Does my father hear the words of his son?' "'Speak,' returned the trapper, in tones that issued from his chest, but which were rendered awfully distinct by the stillness that reigned in the place. "'I am about to depart from the village of the Loops,' 
and shortly shall be beyond the reach of your voice. Let the wise chief have no cares for his journey, continued Hardheart, with an earnest solicitude that led him to forget, for the moment, that others were waiting to address his adopted parent. A hundred loops shall clear his path from briars. Pawnee, I die as I have lived, a Christian man, resumed the trapper with a force of voice that had the same startling effect upon his hearers, as is produced by the trumpet, when its blast rises suddenly and freely on the air, after its obstructed sounds have been heard struggling in the distance. As I came into life, so will I leave it. Horses and arms are not needed to stand in the presence of the great spirit of my people. He knows my color, and according to my gifts will he judge my deeds. My father will tell my young men how many mingos he has struck, and what acts of valor and justice he has done, that they may know how to imitate him. A boastful tongue is not heard in the heaven of a white man, solemnly returned the old man. What I have done he has seen. His eyes are always open. That which has been well done will he remember. Wherein I have been wrong will he not forget to chastise, though he will do the same in mercy. No, my son, a pale face may not sing his own praises and hope to have them acceptable before his God. A little disappointed, the young partisan stepped modestly back, making way for the recent comers to approach. Middleton took one of the meager hands of the trapper, and struggling to command his voice, he succeeded in announcing his presence. The old man listened like one whose thoughts were dwelling on a very different subject, but when the other had succeeded in making him understand that he was present, an expression of joyful recognition passed over his faded features. I hope you have not so soon forgotten those whom you so materially served, Middleton concluded. It would pain me to think my hold on your memory was so light. Little that I have ever seen is forgotten, returned the trapper. I am at the close of many weary days, but there is not one among them all that I could wish to overlook. I remember you with the whole of your company, I and your grandfather, that went before you. I am glad that you have come back upon these plains, for I had need of one who speaks the English, since little faith can be put in the traders of these regions. Will you do a favor to an old and dying man? Name it, said Middleton. It shall be done. It is a far journey to send such trifles, resumed the old man, who spoke at short intervals, as strength and breath permitted. A far and weary journey is the same. But kindness and friendships are things not to be forgotten. There is a settlement among the Otsego Hills. I know the place, interrupted Middleton, observing that he spoke with increasing difficulty. Proceed to tell me what you would have done. Take this rifle and pouch and horn, and send them to the person whose name is graven on the plates of the stock. A trader cut the letters with his knife, for it is long that I have intended to send him such a token of my love. It shall be so. Is there more that you could wish? Little else have I to bestow. My traps I give to my Indian son, for honestly and kindly has he kept his faith. Let him stand before me. Middleton explained to the chief what the trapper had said, and relinquished his own place to the other. Pawnee! continued the old man, always changing his language to suit the person he addressed, and not unfrequently according to the ideas he expressed. It is a custom of my people for the father to leave his blessing with the son before he shuts his eyes forever. This blessing I give to you. Take it, for the prayers of a Christian man will never make the path of a just warrior to the blessed prairies, either longer or more tangled. May the God of a white man look on your deeds with friendly eyes, and may you never commit an act that shall cause him to darken his face. I know not whether we shall ever meet again. There are many traditions concerning the place of good spirits. It is not for one like me, old and experienced though I am, to set up my opinions against the nations. You believe in the blessed prairies, and I have faith in the sayings of my fathers. If both are true, our parting will be final. But if it should prove that the same meaning is hid under different words, 
we shall yet stand together, Pawnee, before the face of your Wakanda, who will then be no other than my God. There is much to be said in favor of both religions, for each seems suited to its own people, and no doubt it was so intended. I fear I have not altogether followed the gifts of my color, inasmuch as I find it a little painful to give up forever the use of the rifle and the comforts of the chase. But then the fault has been my own, seeing that it could not have been his. I, Hector, he continued, leaning forward a little and feeling for the ears of the hound. Our parting has come at last, dog, and it will be a long hunt. You have been an honest and a bold and a faithful hound. Pawnee, you cannot slay the pup on my grave, for where a Christian dog falls, there he lies forever. But you can be kind to him after I am gone, for the love you bear his master. The words of my father are in my ears, returned the young partisan, making a grave and respectful gesture of assent. Do you hear what the chief has promised, dog? demanded the trapper, making an effort to attract the notice of the insensible effigy of his hound. Receiving no answering look, nor hearing any friendly whine, the old man felt for the mouth, and endeavored to force his hand between the cold lips. The truth then flashed upon him, although he was far from perceiving the whole extent of the deception. Falling back in his seat, he hung his head like one who felt a severe and unexpected shock. Profiting by this momentary forgetfulness, two young Indians removed the skin with the same delicacy of feeling that had induced them to attempt the pious fraud. "'The dog is dead,' muttered the trapper, after a pause of many minutes. "'A hound has his time as well as a man, and well has he filled his days, Captain,' he added, making an effort to wave his hand from Middleton. "'I am glad you have come.' For though kind and well-meaning according to the gifts of their color, these Indians are not the men to lay the head of a white man in his grave. I have been thinking, too, of this dog at my feet. It will not do to set forth the opinion that a christen can expect to meet his hound again. Still, there can be little harm in placing what is left of so faithful a servant nigh the bones of his master. It shall be as you desire. I am glad you think with me in this matter. In order, then, to save labor, lay the pup at my feet, or, for that matter, put him side by side. A hunter need never be ashamed to be found in company with his dog. I charge myself with your wish. The old man made a long and apparently amusing pause. At times he raised his eyes wistfully, as if he would again address Middleton, but some innate feeling appeared always to suppress his words. The other, who observed his hesitation, inquired in a way most likely to encourage him to proceed, whether there was aught else that he could wish to have done. "'I am without kith or kin in the wide world,' the trapper answered. "'When I am gone, there will be an end of my race. We have never been chiefs, but honest and useful in our way. I hope it cannot be denied. We have always proved ourselves.' My father lies buried near the sea, and the bones of his son will whiten on the prairies. Name the spot, and your remains shall be placed by the side of your father, interrupted Middleton. Not so, not so, Captain. Let me sleep where I have lived, beyond the den of the settlements. Still, I see no need why the grave of an honest man should be hid, like a redskin in his ambushment. I paid a man in the settlements to make and put a graven stone at the head of my father's resting place. It was of the value of twelve beaver skins, and cunningly and curiously was it carved. Then it told to all comers that the body of such a Christian lay beneath, and it spoke of his manner of life, of his years, and of his honesty. When we had done with the Frenchers in the old war, I made a journey to the spot in order to see that all was rightly performed, and glad I am to say the workman had not forgotten his faith. And such a stone you would have at your grave? I, no, no, I have no son but hard heart, and it is little that an Indian knows of white fashions and usages. Besides, I am his debtor already, seeing it is so little I have done since I have lived in his tribe. The rifle might bring the value of such a thing, but then I know it will give the boy pleasure to hang the piece in his hall, for
for many is the deer and the bird that he has seen it destroy. No, no, the gun must be sent to him, whose name is graven on the lock. But there is one who would gladly prove his affection in the way you wish, he who owes you not only his own deliverance from so many dangers, but who inherits a heavy debt of gratitude from his ancestors. The stone shall be put at the head of your grave. The old man extended his emaciated hand, and gave the other a squeeze of thanks. I thought you might be willing to do it, but I was backward in asking the favor, he said, seeing that you are not of my kin. Put no boastful words on the same, but just the name, the age, and the time of the death, with something from the holy book, no more, no more. My name will then not be altogether lost on earth. I need no more. Middleton intimated his assent, and then followed a pause, that was only broken by distant and broken sentences from the dying man. He appeared now to have closed his accounts with the world, and to await merely for the final summons to quit it. Middleton and Hardhart placed themselves on the opposite sides of his seat, and watched with melancholy solicitude the variations of his countenance. For two hours there was no very sensible alteration. The expression of his faded and time-worn features was that of a calm and dignified repose. From time to time he spoke, uttering some brief sentence in the way of advice, or asking some simple questions concerning those in whose fortunes he still took a friendly interest. During the whole of that solemn and anxious period, each individual of the tribe kept his place in the most self-restrained patience. When the old man spoke, all bent their heads to listen, and when his words were uttered, they seemed to ponder on their wisdom and usefulness. As the flame drew nigher to the socket, his voice was hushed, and there were no moments when his attendants doubted whether he still belonged to the living. Middleton, who watched each wavering expression of his weather-beaten visage, with the interest of a keen observer of human nature, softened by the tenderness of personal regard, fancied he could read the workings of the old man's soul in the strong lineaments of his countenance. Perhaps what the enlightened soldier took for the delusion of the mistaken opinion did actually occur, for who has returned from that unknown world to explain by what forms and in what manner he was introduced into its awful precincts? Without pretending to explain what must ever be a mystery to the quick, we will simply relate facts as they occurred. The trapper had remained nearly motionless for an hour. His eyes alone had occasionally opened and shut. When open, his gaze seemed fastened on the clouds, which hung around the western horizon, reflecting the bright colors and giving form and loveliness to the glorious tints of an American sunset. The hour, the calm beauty of the season, the occasion, all conspired to fill the spectators with solemn awe. Suddenly, while musing on the remarkable position in which he was placed, Middleton felt the hand which he held grasp his own with incredible power, and the old man, supported on either side by his friends, rose upright to his feet. For a moment he looked about him, as if to invite all in presence to listen, the lingering remnant of human frailty. And then, with a fine military elevation of the head, and with a voice that might be heard in every part of that numerous assembly, the word, Hear! The movement so entirely unexpected, and the air of grandeur and humility, which were so remarkably united in the mien of the trapper, together with clear and uncommon force of his utterance, produced a short period of confusion in the faculties of all present. When Middleton and Hardhart, each of whom had involuntarily extended a hand to support the form of the old man, turned to him again, they found that the subject of their interest was removed for ever beyond the necessity of their care. They mournfully placed the body in its seat, and La Balafere arose to announce the termination of the scene to the tribe. The voice of the old Indian seemed a sort of echo from that invisible world to which the meek spirit of the trapper had just departed. A valiant, a just, and a wise warrior has gone on the path which will lead him to the blessed grounds of his people, he said. When the voice of the Wakanda call him, he was ready to answer, Go, my children, remember the just chief of the pale faces, and clear your own tracks from briars. The grave was made beneath the shade of some noble oaks. It has been carefully watched to the present hour by the Pawnees of the Loop, and is often shown to the traveller and the trader as a spot where a just white man sleeps. In due time the stone was placed at its head with the simple inscription which the trapper had himself requested. 
the only liberty taken by Middleton was to add, May no wanton hand ever disturb his remains. End of chapter 34